<laughs> Greetings, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to a Dread and Circuses edition <laughs> of Monster Party. 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 <laughs> oh, hear the crowd roar. Yes. Party. It's a spectacle. Thumbs up. Mm. Thumbs down. Oh, thumbs <laughs> down. Oh, well. See you in the next slide. <laughs> well, <laughs> one more attempt at hinting the name of the topic that you already know. If you're just tuning in. If you're just right. tuning in, we have a very special episode and a special topic. And this is one that it's funny, but we've never really we there are times when we have said that we've we've touched on things. We've touched on movies that have this element in them. Right. But I don't think we ever really discussed this specific part of that movie in detail. Well, well speaking of touching, who are you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> that may be the nicest thing you've ever said to me. I uh, am Matt Weinhold. I am Sean Sheridan. I am Larry Strauss. And I'm James Gonis. And we're going to have fun. This is going to be great. And it's just us after Monster Palooza. We need oh. just some... We yeah. need it. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my God. I'm still, just, just I'm still chill. exhausted. Yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah we did some. Who, who didn't, who didn't relax, felt like you had to relax for like three days after that? Yeah, to decompress a little bit. Exhausting. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, <laughs> big time, big time. And so this is nice. We're having a nice little intimate time. It's just the boys. It's just yeah, the gang. Yeah. And we are going to discuss our wonderful topic. And the topic is... Arenas. 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 Arenas in movies. Genre films. In genre films. No, not just any arena. We're not going to do. Because there's, I'm sure there's an arena documentary about, you know, sports arenas. And I did not, I am not going to watch that one. Sorry. In horror, science fiction, fantasy. What? Yeah. And. I think you guys would agree that I think there are more arenas really in science fiction or fa or fantasy, whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. For the most I think part. So. For the yeah. most part. And I can't wait. If you've got some horror ones, I was I was really thinking about it and it was tough. So yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't yeah. wait to hear what everybody came up with. Yeah, but, but I think um, this is like like spectacles or events that are often with giant audiences or televised yes. and it's usually like battles to the death you know kind of a situation right, you know? right. yeah um, <clears throat> yeah i mean right i think i think you know you look at classic non-genre arena films such as ben-hur or spartacus or right. gladiators and really any of the slew of italian hercules movies you know from the <laughs> 50s and 60s usually had kind of gladiator combats of some kind sure right you know and those are but, those are genre movies yeah well yeah yeah but when you add like sci-fi you have like monsters and aliens and booby traps and things like that it really kind of ups the ante you know yes, and, yes. and it also I, it also really heightens the the jeopardy because very often it's the villain <laughs> Or the villainous society that's putting the heroes in this situation to test them. Yes. And, and as a fight to the death, and they're expendable. They're willing to see them die. And then the heroes right. really have to prove their mettle. Yeah. Right. And, right, and right. I think it's fair to say that these are normally dystopian societies. They're, rarely does a utopian society <laughs> no. put right. people against each other. Right. right. True, true, true. That, that I've come in contact with. And I'm still looking. <laughs> but uh so i have a question for you when you think of an arena that's in a genre of film what was the first thing that came to your mind when you heard arena what was the first thing i would say for me only because it seems to be such a common trope in this tv series and that would be the original star trek series there are Ooh, there are interesting there are many arena type situations throughout the run of that original series i would say I, I can name off four. I mean, there is the okay. classic. There is the classic first season episode called Arena, where Kirk fights the Gorn. And you right. may you may think, well, that's not an arena. Yes, it is because it is. it's the crew of the Enterprise 
watching in terror as Kirk fights the Gorn on this planet. And the aliens who are running this arena are allowing the, the Enterprise crew to watch this unfold. Uh, but then you also have the second season episode, A Mock Time, where it's Spock and Kirk Crow. fighting over the woman. But that's also an arena type situation because the Vulcans doing this ceremony or ritual and, and they all have to watch this. And of course, the other second season episode that we all know is The Gamesters of Triskelion, where it is a, literally an arena situation where these brain type creatures are betting on who's going to win, where these different interracial alien species uh, fight to the death. Uh, and I would also even say the third season episode, The Savage Curtain, because that one is a kind of a rock creature who's kind of a, examining you know, the difference between – he wants to understand the difference between good and evil. So he depicts Kirk and some of his crew against different characters from the past. But it's always that kind of a concept of like a spectacle or event that throw our characters into – and they have to, you know, fight for the t- fight to the death. How many times has Kirk had a fight to the death? You know. Yeah, I agree with all of those. First of all, Arena is based on a 1944 <laughs> short story, also called Arena, by Frederick Brown. And Frederick Brown was an amazing science fiction writer, and uh, he really one of my favorite of the classic authors. And it's one of my favorite episodes. You know, the uninitiated, the non Star Trek fans, James. Um, <laughs> What? <laughs> that, <laughs> that episode could seem a little silly by watching it with today's eyes that, you know, you've got this slow creature who is obviously slow because the actors in this big foam costume. I would assume that a lizard would move faster in a hot environment, right? Mm. Yeah, probably. But the Gorn design is so cool and it's so yeah. neat to see in Star Trek because I think before then we saw people with some big heads and we saw the Klingons who kind of really just looked like they were, you know, like Mongols or something yeah. in, the, in space costumes. Here you get a full body suit alien yeah, fighting, you know, one on one with Captain Kirk and Captain Kirk. It's like his one man show. He doesn't realize that the crew of the Enterprise are watching all of this until the yeah. very end. Right. But, you know, there's a really important element about the story that everyone seems to brush over. And I just wanted to point out, Matt, that that short story by Frederick Brown, for listeners, if you haven't checked out that short story, it's not long. No. It's, and, it's, yeah. and it is a great story. And if, it's a great thing to read and then compare it to the classic yes. Star Trek because there are differences that are so cool. When my wife taught uh, the sci-fi class, that's one of the things that she did. The class had to read the story and then they watched the Star Trek episode. And it's really, really cool because the two entities, the human and this creature are put at this planet and they have to battle for, you know, the survival or destruction of their species. Right. But they're, but they're divided by this like invisible shield kind of. And then the creature is more like a blob like creature. And it's so yes. cool. Mm. But yes. the really important thing about that Star Trek episode that people gloss over is how it starts is the Enterprise are going to go down to this planet on the outskirts of the farthest reaches of the, the galaxy. And on this planet, they have a really nice star base. It's really fancy and everything's really nice. And they have a fancy, ta- you know, lots of fancy food stuff. And they're going to go down to kind of have I remember this, the like, food. Kind of, well, they, they, there's a line where he says, Dr. McCoy says something about the spread that they put on. Oh, the you know, captain you know, sets a really yeah, good uh, table. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, that's right. right. That's right. That's so right. Yeah, that's so right. Yeah. So, and, and then, and then Spock questions, why is it that they've asked us for all our technical people too? And they're like, oh, Spock, you don't know what you're talking about. We're dying to go to this place. When they go to Cestus Reed, when they beam down, the whole place has been obliterated. These aliens, this Gorn, they feel that the humans have invaded their space. So then there's an actual element where are the humans, you know, we're thinking of Captain Kirk and, and uh, you know, we're doing good. And this is, you know, we believe in, uh, you know, our our union of planets and stuff. But maybe they're in the wrong here. Maybe right. they took this planet away from these lizard guys. And so that's a really cool element in that story. It's not just Kirk is a good guy and this alien is a bad guy. And well, that's something I really, really like. I do like that, and I think that's great, and I love the episode, and I love how they don't 
paint the alien as just this monster, you know, they have their motivation as well. And maybe there was a misunderstanding. Sure. But I will say that I, I still think the Gorn were the assholes in this situation <laughs> because the Gorns could have said, hey, what are you doing on our planet instead of just wiping everybody out? But lizards are lizards. It's, you know, all through human history, there's, you know, when two species, you know, two cultures Back, come together, right, sometimes right. there is a clash. But uh, true, another, yes. neat, another neat thing about that is one of the things we love is it was shot, the whole sequence on the planet was shot outside Los Angeles at a place called Vasquez Rocks. And you can you can go out there today. Yeah, and the to rocks this day. That, and yeah. you, where the rocks are, it looks like you just, you you go to the planet. Yeah, That's yeah. how great it looks. Yeah, you're on the set. And, and it's, it's like Star Trek shot more than that episode out there. But right. it's very, it, I mean, the rocks, the way the shape, the, the rock formations are, it's, it's iconic. So really cool. cool. Yeah. And the guy who played the Gorn, actually there were three guys, but the main guy was Bobby Clark. And uh, Bobby Clark, he was also a stuntman. But, you know, he was sweating bullets when he was out there. Because oh my God, I can imagine. Stuff. My God, and I'm surprised he's still alive. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, one of the big thrills for me was going to, I, I actually met him at Comic-Con. Right. Cool. So yeah, cool. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I ended up talking to him for the longest time and he couldn't have been nicer. It was so great. Um, he's still happy can, to be out of the costume. I mean, can you, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, he's done so much television work, but what he's known for is playing the Gorn in Star Trek. Right, right. Well, and he's happy to talk about it. So I, cool. I do need, if we're, before we move on from that arena episode of Star Trek, there is another episode of a science fiction show, The Outer Limits. Yes. That did right. an episode that was very much like arena. Now, all parties involved say that it was not taken from that story, but I'm sorry it was. Okay. Right. <laughs> the episode is called Fun and Games, and it's, it stars one of our favorites, Nick Adams. That's right. Mm -hmm. And him and Nancy Malone, they're uh, picked at random, really, to represent Earth in a, a, a similar type battle where they're right. going to be fighting an alien, uh, two aliens male and female and it's for it's really just to entertain these aliens from andera and they just like to watch this kind of thing but one civilization will be destroyed or the other right. and just like the star trek episode they get beamed to this planet this planet is a little different instead of being the dry vasquez rocks environment this one is more it's more swampy, tropical. When you look at a lake, there's bubbling things happening all over the place. And <laughs> and it, it, it looks really cool. And it's uh, yeah. Gerd Oswald directed it. And it's just beautiful. I mean, just like most Outer Limits episodes are. They're just gorgeous to look at. And then you've got Nick Adams doing his <laughs> Nick Adams thing, barking at everybody and... Because he's like a crook, right? He's like he's like yeah. he's kind of given up on humanity. He's like yeah, really cynical. Right. He's cynical, yeah. and she's uh, Nancy Malone is a little more idealistic and right. wants to fight for life. And uh, and there's this nice buildup too, which is absolutely film noir through and through, where a violent thing happens at this poker game, this illicit poker game, and that starts the episode. Again, they say that it's not based on arena. It is. You watch right. it, and I think you will agree with me, right? Right. Yeah, tell yes. absolutely. So read that. Read that short story. That's what yeah, we want yeah. to say. Sean, did you mention you mentioned bread and circuses, right? Oh he no, did, actually, did, you're right. That, that's I one have, too. I have, I have that. You're right. The, the other Star Trek episode. Right. Explain yeah. that one. But yes, correct. Sean was going into a Star Trek frenzy. You know, just <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I I get it. Bread and circuses from classic Star Trek. This was from 1968. You know, the funny thing is it was written by Roddenberry and Gene L. Kuhn. And, and sometimes when you look at an episode like this, you think Roddenberry was trying to think like a producer. He was the executive producer of the show. And he goes, you know, what set pieces are around here? <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. And, and of course, this is so 68. You know, you've had a lot of period pieces of like Romans, you know, sure. uh, religious films. So there's a lot of that stuff all over Hollywood. OK, yeah. so, you know, it's interesting. Here's this planet that seemed like it had some promise. And so the 
Federation sends these guys down to kind of not necessarily interact or and say, hey, we're from the Federation, just kind of be secretive and kind of blend in and report back. And and so things do not go as well. So Kirk and, and the Enterprise go down to check it out and they find out that you have this world, which is very much into television, like America was, you know, in the 50s, 60s, television was a big deal, but they actually had Romanesque people fighting. They would have battles, televised battles. And if you think about it, we used to have a show called American, remember American Gladiators? Sure. Yeah. On that yeah. TV show. And sure, no one got killed. You know, but, and we but, know of. But, right. you know, when I watch that, I go, oh, it's only a matter of time. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think that on every competition show. As, yeah. soon as, but, as soon as Naked and Afraid came out, I was like, everyone's going to die. But what's <laughs> interesting about the episode is so Kirk and Spock, they find out what the deal is with this planet, not really exposing who they were, although there is one main guy who finds out about the Federation and knows about, oh, you can't use that. There's that uh, non-interference rule and stuff like that. So he feels like he's got them. But it's neat because it's televised. So the battles are televised. The people getting killed are all t- is all televised. And so if you think about it, it is an arena. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. And in a nutshell, it is Rome. It is the Roman Empire as we know it from the yeah. past. Yeah. modern day if like yeah. it had been allowed to continue to the mm-hmm. modern day where there's cars and there's television yeah. of course the gladiator games would be on television and they're still slaves yes. and you get this little reference allusion to the early christians in it yes just kind yes. of interesting and if i remember correctly there's a, a federation guy who kind of switches on the federation and joins the, yeah, the, Romans. the Roman teams. Yeah. yeah, and he's like a mm-hmm. he's like a traitor. But what's neat is there's also a gladiator who is a great gladiator who turns into a slave, who's played by Rhodes Reason. Yay! Who just a year before was in King Kong Escapes. And That's I right. To myself, can you imagine going from King Kong Escapes <laughs> to Star Trek? <laughs> That's cool. How man. cool is that? Yeah, and, and then after that, I think it was New Zero Review, right? Wasn't it? <laughs> no, no, I don't remember him on News Review. Um, uh, you look, could have missed yeah, him. Yeah, no, no, Rhodes, you know, he was in over like, I think over 200 shows. He I was mean, great. Granted, you know, granted, maybe not everything he got star billing like in King Kong Escapes, but he was a great, solid actor. And, and his yeah, he was a good was, leading man. We yeah. all know we all know his older brother, that's uh, Rex Reason, who was in This Island Earth. Right, but, right. But you know, Rex... You know, he did some big films, and he was up to play the main character, the Manchurian Candidate. But then, Rhodes it, Reason or Rex? Ro, no, Rex, Rex, really, Rex Reason. really. Yeah, I didn't but, know but, that. Wow. But, but 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 there was a thing where um, it went to Harvey, Lawrence Harvey. Uh, Lawrence Harvey. Right. But the funny thing is, I met Rex Reason at a, at a one of those autograph shows. Yeah. And what's cool is after you know he. He did the Hollywood game for a while, but then he got into real estate. And after that, he started to do these tapes that you would listen to, like, inspire yourself. Because he had oh, that. really? Big, wow. Really? Big Ins- inspirational, inspirational tapes, really? He did inspirational tapes. So you hear him and goes, this is Rex Reason. You can do it. You know, that. <laughs> and, and it was so really? Funny because when I, when I met him at the show, I was, I was so surprised. And I had a great time with him talking. And then at the end, of, I, I got an autograph. I paid for it. And he goes, would you like to be interested in one of these <laughs> inspirational tapes? <laughs> did you get it? I wish I did. Oh, uh, so yeah. The, no, I know. I get it. But, but yeah, that would have yeah. been cool. Like, I, look, yeah, I, I, I digress. I digress from the main thing. I'm just saying that Rhodes Reason, I, I think he does a great job in that Star Trek episode. Breads and Services. Right. He, he's great. And another thing that I really liked about that episode is the slaves would wear this sort of like a, it's like a sweatshirt thing. And... Mm-hmm. Right near the collar, it had these link chains. It was like a little emblem. Yeah, that's and, cool. And it was like three links of a chain. And so when I was in high school, <laughs> I, had a, I had a friend. And it wasn't even me. It was a friend of mine who was like this amazing athlete. But he was really cool. And he was into punk rock. And he was a great guy. He got this gray sweatshirt. And he put that little emblem on it. And every time <laughs> he would come to gym class, he'd be wearing this thing. That's <laughs> awesome. And I saw this and I was like, wow, 
the guy who's really good at sports and is, you know, you consider maybe a jock. He's one of us. Yeah, That's you you've, in, you've inspired me, Matt. You've yeah, inspired me. I think because and also the sleeves were kind of cut off, right? Yes, that's or right. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it is kind of punk, you know. It is kind of punk. Pull yeah, sleeves and do that little thing. I thought you said you did that. I'm I surprised. I wish I, I wish I would have thought of that. I didn't. <laughs> you know, there was only I only had so many ways that I could get my ass kicked. There's, you know, like <laughs> right. I just like, hey, let's turn this into a Star Trek costume as well. <laughs> well speaking yeah, of ass so, kicking <laughs> yeah, yeah please I, I wanted to find out what james james had james what did you think of first mind. well actually i mean there's there's a lot and so I, I i can't tell you exactly why my mind went there first but i went to attack of the clones a climactic scene ah, maybe not yes. the climactic scene on geonosis yeah where anakin and padme and obi-wan and Mace Windu, you know, they're in a lot of the Jedi there, they're facing off against these not not only clones, but the beasts that they're riding and all of right. these yes. aliens. Yeah, that's the yeah. first thing. That's the first thing is that when they're brought out, they're tied to those pillars, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And those beasts come out. Yeah. And you're those like, how the hell are they going to get out of this? Ridiculous creatures. <laughs> they are yeah, ridiculous. It was, it was CGI oh, 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 mania. Oh, 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 that cat yeah. creature. Oh, that, that cat. That cat creature. And, oh. You know, and obvious CGI. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. apart from that, in, or in league with that, I the, the second thing along the Star Wars lines that I might have thought of was in The Phantom Menace from 1999. Yeah where it's the big pod racing scene yes, and yes. the the introduction of that is this big parade of all the pod racers, which is completely out of Ben-Hur before the yes. chariot race, right. even down to the John Williams, you know, fanfare music, which, cause it's all just so clearly inspired. But, you know, I mean, I never really thought that it, it, it I always thought it was more of an homage than a ripoff, you know, and it, it was one of the, the <laughs> more amazing hey. things maybe about the movie. And, and it was voiced, the announcer was voiced by our own Greg Proops. That's right. Ah, That's right. Ah, yeah. Okay. And, you know, when we get to Attack of the Clones, it was, it was weird because I watched that one and there's a lot to hate in that movie. Oh, my God, Matt. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, but, I, yes. but I have to say it was more fun than Phantom Menace. Yeah, I agree. Uh, everything's uh, more fun than Phantom. everything was more fun than Phantom Menace. But you know, just when you'd be kind of enjoying yourself, then C three PO would say something, you know, voice some terrible joke, right? And, and you'd just be like, "Oh fuck, <laughs> why, why? Don't do this again." Yeah. And I will never forget. So I was on the Bob and Tom show, which is this very popular syndicated radio show. And whenever I was in Indiana, I would go on their show and they love me and they're really nice guys, both of them. And were just have been so nice to me in my career. And they wanted me to review Attack of the Clones. Now, at this time, I was dating someone who worked at Lucasfilm. <laughs> and to this day, oh my God. I, I want to apologize to everyone, but I gave it. A slightly better review than it deserved. Oh, are you kidding? I, are I'm not you proud. Kidding? I'm not proud. Now I didn't. I didn't gush and say that it was the greatest movie ever made or anything like sure. that. But I did. I did talk it up a little more than it deserved. And uh, it's amazing what the ladies will make you do. <laughs> you know, look. I don't. I don't want this to turn turn into a, a shit on Star Wars night. But you know. Yeah, but I why do, not? I, I do have to say, you know, Matt, you brought up a couple words, the word hate, you know, hate. and, and there's, yes, I think when I, I, I loved Star Wars when it came out, I of was course. a big fan. Yeah, of course. We all did. And then those two, those two films came out. I, I got, not only did I hate, I, I got really angry and I got even more angry when the guy who creates it the guy who is this you know whiz this brilliant genius you know i actually wrote down hack here um <laughs> but, but but it's like as a joke as a joke the working title for attack the clones 
yeah. was Jar Jar's Great Adventure. <laughs> that was that was a working title as an in joke because Lucas knew that people hated Jar Jar Binks from the first one. So this is kind of like oh, and it to me it's like it, it's more of like spit in the faces of the the people who were big Star Wars fans and and let's call it for what it is. It's it's like if you were five. And you saw, you know, Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones, you probably loved it, you know, and you're probably a big, huge fan. And, and right, yeah. like when I yeah. first saw Star Wars, how magical it was for me. Right. And like millions of other people like me who saw it in their the first one in their teens, as these films continued, we go, Well, what happened? Yeah. But I guess the reality is these films weren't meant for me. Now, look, if I was in like a mood like Sean and go, Hey, I'm going to smoke some reefer tonight and I'm going to watch <laughs> attack of the clones. Maybe I could cut loose and I could enjoy it more. I don't no. think, I don't think no. I enjoy the prequels even when I'm really high. Like, <laughs> no. Trust me. No. I'm trying to see James's point. Yes. James, those sequences, those are big spectacle arena type things. Yeah. And I see, I enjoyed attack of the clones sequence better than the first one. Even though it had the wooden acting and the terrible dialogue, and um, if I was just to cut loose and go, "Hey, I'm drinking and I'm watching this," hey, you know, maybe that could be fun. This is um, this is where you and I are different, and I think I think I can include Sean in on this. Is that Sean and I, when we partake in whatever, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden our standards just melt away. You know, right, we still right. we still have good taste. There are just elements of something that we might notice when we're high that maybe we didn't when we weren't. Oh, l- yeah. well, let me let me admit this. I was really high on a really strong edible when I went to see The Last Jedi, and I shouldn't even have driven home, but I was driving home <laughs> really high thinking, what the fuck did I just see? <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, I was completely uh, sober, and it's, I still said the same thing. Uh, James. So. so look, if you're listening, we just want to say that that's a bad thing to take an edible. What the, what the, who the <laughs> fuck are you? What is this? Yeah, what is, yeah. is this? Is this yeah. snippets? Yeah. What is this? That's the more you know. Wow. All, 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 of, all of a sudden, here comes Batman and Robin here to give us <laughs> yeah. our, our crime Remember, stopper of the day. Don't take edibles alone. Yeah. <laughs> Get a new one. <laughs> okay, okay, right. but okay, but I, uh, James, I see your point, and those you? are yes, I do. Those are two big epic arena sequences, and that's films. true. That was on my list. It was on my list yeah. too. All right, so that was what you thought of. I'm going to tell you what I thought of. Okay, you know, when the topic of arenas, which by the way comes from the mind of Sean Sheridan, the Twisted reefer mind of Sean Sheridan. <laughs> how, how it took him just really, I uh, just like breaking on through to the other <laughs> side to come up with this one. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Arenas. Uh, the first thing I thought of was Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Sure. Because, oh. And I, I thought someone was going to bring this up first because Thunderdome has almost become like a go to reference for yes. any type of yeah. arena thing. You're right, you're right. Yeah. And that's a movie that I don't particularly enjoy. No. Yeah, I, I like mean, I, it, I it like has, the first part of it. I like the Thunderdome part. Yeah, it's it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's like uneven, wouldn't you say, Matt? Big time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because that yeah. whole first sequence is, is that it's cool. Is, is cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's I agree. Master Blaster, all that yeah, stuff is all awesome. of that it's, stuff. So yeah. look, for listeners who haven't seen that third installment of the Mad Max thing, that's that sequences. So after Road Warrior, Max he doesn't have the car anymore, and he, he gets, gets it stolen, the, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. He's, get, he's got this. He goes to this town where all the derelict people go because it's the one place that has life or food or water or something. And right. he's trying to sell his skills as you know he's a tough dude, and and so maybe he can get something out of it, and makes friends with. The lovely Tina Turner, who has that great sort of, hit sort song. of makes friends. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's interesting the dynamic where Tina and her team go. Hey, if we use this guy to fight this master blaster or this big dude, then maybe we can have control over this barter town. And you, it, wouldn't you say that the guy, the guy has a giant helmet, very 
you know, in a way, Star Wars, Darth Vader like, but he's monstrous and he's terrifying. But they get put in this giant dome and they get attached by these bungee cords. Like and, bungee cords, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and do you remember, they get, Max gets a, a chainsaw, right? And so, yeah. And, and this battle I thought was really cool. And they have spikes coming in around the dome. The ingenuity and, and, of that fight scene is yeah. so good. To me, it, it was like another screenwriter took over after that. Because yeah. yes, Matt, then, yes, because this whole sequence fits so well into the post-apocalyptic future Mad that Max universe. George yeah. Miller had created for the prior two films, and I kept feeling like things were getting worse in this world, and I felt like we got that, and then it suddenly became this after-school special with these little <laughs> kids who yeah. see. Yeah. Max as some sort of messiah, and it's just it's just nonsense. Yeah. And these kids, as soon as I saw like 15 kids come out of nowhere and now they're all around Max, I was like, this movie's over. This it is it. Into, I don't it right. turns into Hush a by Mountain from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> <laughs> which 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 I like in that world. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, right. Yeah. right. But it doesn't fit in the Mad Max world. And I there's a crossover. Was, there's a crossover of film for you. It was yeah. James. James, wouldn't you feel it was it was forced? It was pushed. It was yeah. It seemed there, like there, it didn't fit in that world. There must have been some kind of commercial consideration that they forced George Miller into. It's like, yeah. listen, you got to make it. What? You know, World Happy Warrior was amazing, but it's find something. Find something with more broad appeal. Make it more family friendly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. Make Mad Max make, family friendly. Like, what? make it hopeful. I don't yeah, want. Yeah. I don't want yeah. my Mad Max movies to be hopeful. No, no. And, and and also on top of that, just for for if you listeners, if you haven't seen it, the whole Master Blaster thing. So there's this big hulking guy, but he doesn't talk. Right. And on the back of him is this little guy, Angelo Rizzito. Yeah, who is the master? He's the one running the town right, because yeah. it, it's basically he's the. Oh, I, I was going to say pimp, but he's like. The mob boss and he's the thing. master, and the other guy's the blaster. Yeah. I always and thought Auntie Entity was the ruler. Well, yeah, she's the ruler, but, but like the fighting master blaster is kind of like a combination of two guys together as one. Right. Yeah. Yes. You know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't I, know. He, genius. He, he, he runs that area. But the, yeah. so, so, and so the little guy, he seems kind of evil, but then he has this change too with the kids. And that's, mm -hmm. that's another thing. Remember he was in a little suit and like, what, what the hell? I thought this guy <laughs> would have been thrown on a spike or something. And, you know, <laughs> right. you know, we need to get to, it wasn't to me, it, the film wasn't true to itself. You know, yeah, it's like right. you said, Matt, it is a brutal existence. I wasn't sure if it was going to go to where uh, Max ends up being the ruler, you know, taking people out and being the ruler. That would have been better. Uh, yeah. well, but but then it, it's like the irony is, you know, this is the one thing he would not have wanted, but then he gets made the ruler of this place and he's trying to be a wise ruler, but but didn't even go there. It just there's also, no. there's, there's also confusing elements too, like the uh, the copter pilot from uh, uh, Road Warrior. Uh, uh, he comes uh, he comes back and you're not even really sure if he's the same character. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. Well, his teeth yeah, look a lot a better, mess. so he can't, he can't be, yeah, but, but there is a cool sequence of the arena, because you have all of the town, they're climbing yeah. all over that giant geodesic dome, yes. and yeah. that is a, that is a cool, that's scene. a great all, scene, all, all that yeah. stuff is great, yeah, I mean, once you, I mean, I'd almost like watch it to that, and then, ah, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, although, you know, I guess you should watch it all the way through, and you're right, Matt, it should have been, it should have kept that dark edge, it got soft, you know. It's like of all the of all the franchises that go soft, why did they do that? Yeah, don't you know, do that it was here. Thing about, Mad Max. That was the great thing about Fury Road because it was a return to form. <laughs> yeah, that's it was. true. That is it true. Was. Yes. It was. It was. Yeah, it was like badass again. You know, which I like. Although I, I would have loved more Max, but okay. Yes, that's true. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I wanted to say, like, when I came up with the idea for this episode, the reason oh. I came to me is because my wife Gina and I watched John Carter again. Oh, um, that, okay. That's that's where the idea came because I really like John Carter. It's, I mean, Me we've too. talked about it many times. It's it's a totally misunderstood movie. It's actually a great film. And yes. just real quick, the basic premise of it is 
John Carter is the Civil War soldier who's transported accidentally to Mars. And basically on Mars, there's these different warring factions of Martians. And there's this race of beings called the Therns. And they're kind of superior beings who manipulate the different civilizations of planets to make them fight and destroy each other. And then they feed off the resources of their worlds. And that's what they're doing on Mars, which is known as Barsoom to the native tribes. And there's one sequence where, where John Carter, he teams up with a Martian named Tars Tarkas. It's this really cool <laughs> forearm guy. And they're thrown into this giant arena where they are forced to fight these huge white apes. And it's fantastic. And because John Carter has different abilities on the environment of Mars, he can jump really high and he has more strength. So he kind of... He has a kind of a decent chance to fight these apes because these things are huge and he's chained up. And but it's it's a great sequence. It's a really cool, great fantasy epic arena scene, kind of like we're how we're talking about how like in the two Star Wars films. This to me, you know, totally beats those as far as a really satisfying uh, fantasy adventure uh, arena scene with all kinds of monsters. And it's great. So that's straight out of like Edgar Rice Burroughs books. I just thought that was a really cool epic arena sequence. You know, it's funny when you say that, that whole sequence in the arena is so cool, Sean. I would take that any day over the Star Wars one. Yeah, yeah, oh, of and, course. Yeah. You know, it's a, sh- a shame. We've kind of talked about this before, but this is back in 2009. And just to give listeners like a, a little bit of like history, at the time, there was a, a star director at Pixar named Andrew Stanton, and he was yes. the genius and whiz with Lasseter behind Toy Story, Finding Dory. But he was considered a genius. And this was like his first opportunity to do a live action film. Now, the idea of Orville John Carter, that had been in Hollywood for years. Right, Harry, right. Ray Harryhausen wanted to do that. but These books have imagine, been around forever, though. They, I mean, they've that's been, right. been around for yeah. a while. When Disney finally decided, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have this story, this science fiction story, they were trying to find their Star Wars, okay? Because they yeah, had right. Star Wars at the time. Um, but they wanted their own science fiction thing. This seemed like Fran- a great franchise, idea. another big franchise. Franchise, franchise, franchise. When that film came out, think about it. This is a story that was written long time ago by Edgar Rice Burroughs. It came out at the same time as The Hunger Games. Something right. hip, younger. Where did the teenagers go? They went to Hunger Games. And the other thing is the idiots in the Disney marketing said, well, it's called John Carter of Mars, but we're not going to call it that. We're just going to call it John Carter. How idiotic can you yeah. be? That film cost so much money. Yeah, it was right. a huge bomb. And right. the sad thing about it is that film, that because people didn't see it, it was just written off as, oh, it's a shitty film. Yeah, and, yeah. Sean, like you said, you know what? I went to see it because I go, well, I'll go. You know, it wasn't that bad. I Maybe I didn't like it as much as you did. I, I really enjoy, like it. I, 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 like I, enjoy, I did enjoy with it. With repeated yes. viewings, uh, it gets better. And to I, me, like you're saying, Larry, like the Hunger Games, that whole franchise is about a kind of a gladiatorial kind of yes. arena type well, thing. The whole franchise, whole books. That, that's but like John list, Carter. Yes. Think of like all the books in the John Carter series that could have been such a great franchise. I know, Sean. It's a shame. I think it was mismanaged. And just to yeah. let you know, there were a ton of people who lost their jobs at Disney yeah, because yeah. of John Carter. There's right. this woman who was I I forget her name. But we could do a, we could do a whole episode on John Carter. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this woman, she was very arrogant. She was so full of herself, and she she was responsible for that whole campaign, which was an entire which was a debacle. Yeah, and it's a shame because Sean, like you said, it's really a good. It's a really good film. It's a good movie. I, yes. It's a good use of CGI. It's like, yes, it's yes, it's a huge, big budget CGI spectacle, but it's done well. The characters are likable. It, it just all works. Even if they called it John Carter of Mars, it still probably would have bombed. Maybe they should have called it Mars Games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something, yeah. <laughs> well, if you haven't seen John Carter, I would agree with Sean. I think that's something you should check out, and I think it might surprise you. It's really a, a well done film. It's really neat, and and you know I don't feel bad for Stanton because I mean after that the, he was like written off. Oh, he's poison! But he went back to Pixar, which is where he stayed, and right, right. He, he did a but he had a lot of success with the other Pixar films. So right, he's right. doing fine, you know. I um, was worried, but no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but we brought up the Hunger Games based on yes. a series of books. 
by Suzanne Collins made into a long running film series. Mm -hmm. And everybody loves that. And everybody glommed on and thought this was this cool thing with teenagers and so original. And I would bet that me and the lovely James Gonis were probably thinking the same thing. This is a fucking ripoff. It's been done. Battle Royale. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. 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 If you have watched the Hunger Games series and read the books and you haven't seen Battle Royale, then (laughs) something has gone terribly wrong in your life. (laughs) Because that is one of the greatest movies ever made. It's one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite films of all time. It's wonderful. It's it's just wonderful. And there was a sequel, not nearly as good, but no. If you love the first one, you can check it out. It's Hunger Games was like a, a real edge to it. Like it's, I mean, it's it's kind of like the real nasty way to do it. That's the thing too, is that the Hunger Games has this teen soap opera feel to it, right? And you know, Lenny Kravitz is walking around, and I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if, if I if I may, if I may, Battle Royale, that's a great film. But if you imagine, it's it's like it's a big class, and as far as getting to know, you do get to know some of the main characters who who last, but the ones that aren't around very, very long, you don't really get to know them very well. And I think with the hunger games, it's a smaller group of people. And of course it. Focuses and unfortunately on... you get to know them. Katniss Everdeen. Everdeen. Yeah. She, I, good Lord. You Look, don't like her? There's one well, movie in that. If that, first of all, I fucking love Jennifer Lawrence. Sure. All right, let's get that out of the way. She's dreamy, but she's also (laughs) a really good actress. Yeah, she is. And I like her in movies that I don't even like. I liked her in this. I like her in the Hunger Games. But there's not really a lot to that character after a while. Well, see, did you stick with, did you see all the... uh, the I watched as many as I could stand. (laughs) I watched three of them. I think that's what I've seen. But but, but, but Matt, Matt, I, I would say that also... Battle Royale takes the Lord of the Flies approach too. Yes. Which yes. which which yeah. the Hunger Games doesn't go in that direction. No. They're more like the victims of a society. Yeah, yeah. Lord of the Flies angle does not really come into play in the Hunger Games movies. You know, it, but it, mm-hmm. that that element is there in in Battle Royale. What one is more about a totalitarian society and the way that they it's bread and circuses. It's the way that they entertain yeah. people and right. take their minds off of all the stuff that they don't have right. and subjugate others. Whereas with Battle Royale, it's a little bit more of a drastic way of dealing with juvenile delinquency. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And James, if you could run us through the general plot of that movie. A Battle Royale? Well, um, this high school class, right? Or junior high school, right? Or junior high? Junior high. They're taken to an island and they're each given a knapsack that contains weapons and then they're told that they have to fight for their lives. And that's pretty much it. The the movie is you've got these different cliques. You've got these different, you know, typical sort of teenage uh, dramas going on, but all of that pales in comparison to the fight for survival. Yeah. And And, and don't they, don't they have a neck thing? They have to fight, right? Because they have the, they're they're forced to fight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause they'll be killed. The neck thing will kill them. If they decide not to, but there are some nice elements in battle Royale. First of all, you have beat Takeshi and he is their teacher and he hates them so much (laughs) (laughs) from the very beginning. He is brutal (laughs) to them. I don't want to give anything away because there's some nice fun surprises, but he hates them so much. And he is, you know, he's like the Japanese Robert Mitchum. He's got this smoldering (laughs) intensity to him. He's got so much charisma. So you have his element where he's watching the proceedings and in a way still kind of their teacher in a perverse yeah. way. And then there are elements to the game that I think were interesting. So, yeah, you get a bag and you could get it's it's pure chance what you get. Right. So you right. just run and you grab a bag and the bag could have a knife. The bag could have a gun. The Bag could also have like a uh, egg whisker or, you know, like something <laughs> yeah, yeah. completely useless. Right. Anything and, can be a weapon. And, or not. Or I mean, I, I mean, you'll <laughs> have to do something with it. You'll have to figure it out. But right. I like I do like all the clicks because 
what they do with high school cliques is where you get the subtle tension in high school and you got all that hate and mistrust and jealousy and what have you just bubbling under the surface. And this, it's a little closer to the surface. Well, now, be, now it becomes <laughs> life and death. Yeah, yeah now, it's it's like, like, now it's life and death. But then you also have like the computer geeks. Oh, I and love the that. Yeah. The computer oh, geeks have their own way of fighting this game. Right. And, yeah. and it's and it's brilliant. I think that was yeah. so clever to to have that. And then on top of it, and this is a, another beautiful little wrench in the works, is that aside from just the class, you also have these people who want to be in the game, who are these guys who are just <laughs> oh. fucking sadist. Yeah, and, yeah. so scary. And they do guys. it just for fun. Yeah. Right, right. Now, yeah, now, now it's great. Of this sort of subclass of arena type or televised, you know, torture type stuff, you've also got two books written by Stephen King under the pseudonym Richard Bachman. Uh, uh, yes. Way back in the 70s, one of them is called The Long Walk, about a walking marathon among all these young boys who, as soon as they start to stumble or fall, and this is an endless marathon. You just walk until you drop. But if you drop, there's a tank rolling nearby. It's going to kill you. It's just going to shoot you dead. There's been attempts to film this. Frank Darabont has attempted it. It's a really thrilling book. It's a great book, yeah. Anyone who hasn't read it, I recommend it. And then, um, you know, the, the, it becomes a spectacle. I mean, it's not a physical arena necessarily, but the, the entire, you know, the, the entire town becomes involved and they're all on the sidelines cheering these guys on. Uh, and then the winner gets, you know, untold riches and prizes and celebrity. And then the other one has been filmed uh, <laughs> as the running man, the running man with Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, it became kind of a, a, a comedy, which yeah, has sat- a lot of charm. Satire. You know, I enjoy that satire. movie. Yeah, I, I really do. Both of those titles are the, the running man is apparently going to be remade sometime soon. I've heard. Really? And mm-hmm. finally, the long walk is also going to see the light of day. So uh, really? really? Yes. So uh, I don't think it's Darabont. Uh, he might somehow be involved, but these are both going to be potentially really riveting if they stick to the source material. Mm, interesting. I haven't thought about The Long Walk in years. I want to read that again. I haven't read it since I think it first came out. I mean, King in, in, in the early days, he had so much raw talent and it's just a great read. I've, I've reread it and I, I want to reread it again. So, yeah. When it comes to arena themed movies or tv shows would anything involving a car would that be considered as part of this so like a race like death yeah. race 2000 well, yeah i, I consider yeah, death race 2000 for sure yeah because that one's a lot of fun too and that's I, I mean i would think that would be almost kind of a good double feature with the running man because they're both satirical yes yeah right. that's true and i would also throw in for like a futuristic sport that everybody watch a sadistic futuristic sport rollerball oh yeah well yeah, yes that's, that's absolutely a, an yeah. arena type situation yes and we're we're not too far away from that that will happen in our lifetime yeah. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> yeah, sure yeah really i know as far as corporations being behind everything yeah right right and we can't just gloss over rollerball because rollerball is one of those films that just like you were saying sean about John Carter, how each time you watch it, it gets better, which I would agree with. It's the yeah. same way I feel about Rollerball. Because when I saw Rollerball in the theater, I liked it and it stuck with me. Like yeah, it had this yeah. afterlife that I carried around. And there were these moments in the world building that I thought just were so unique. And like one of the scenes, it's not even the Rollerball scene. But, but we're talking about the 1975 version. Yeah. Oh, by God. Norman yes. Jewison. Thank you. I just, <laughs> thank you. you know, you're going off, Matt. And I, I just, I'm sorry. I didn't mean oh, to please. Thank you so much Thanks. for clarifying. <laughs> do not, do not, in, <laughs> under any circumstances, watch the remake of Rollerball. We're talking you the know? 1975 directed by Norman Jewison, starring yes. James Conn. James, the wonderful Maude James Conn. Yeah. I mean, at, at the peak of his 70s. skills. Yeah. And there is a scene in that movie where you're just getting an idea of what this world is like. And it's a bunch of the elites and they're having a party and they've got this flamethrower gun and they're just blowing up trees. Yeah. The yeah. One, the one, and they're the just, ah, ha, 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 and they're the walking around and yeah. having a great time and woohoo, and they're just blowing up trees. 
And that kind of sums it all up. It's just, yeah, yeah. It, I know. It's so horrifying. And then there are nice details like Jonathan E, who is James Conn, and he's the main character, and he's the star player of the Houston rollerball team. He's like and the Michael Jordan or the, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the Tom but, Brady of the sport yes. in a way. And but he's the so problem big. with that, though, is that there can't be a Michael Jordan. Yeah, you this, can't be a star. In this society, you can't stand out. And right. so what they try to do, because he's just winning and winning and winning and winning, that they try to make him retire, but he won't. Right, right. Because they fucked they him over him? enough. He had this wife that he was in love with and another guy from executive, a corporation. An executive, yeah. An executive from the corporation wanted her and that was it. Uh, he got her. But, and, right. but Matt, wouldn't you say the game itself is very violent? It's like what people say about football. It's very violent. There's a certain amount of rules. The way they're trying to get rid of them is, and it's within the season, they start changing the rules. The rules that right. are like kind of help protect people. Right. And now it's like, okay, we're going to take out that rule. And that'll get rid of them. Oh, no, no, we'll take out this well, rule. Right. That'll get rid of them. Well, well or, then let me set the picture then because – what this is, it's a lot like roller derby. So you got guys right, on right. skates, but aside from people on skates, there are also motorcycles. <laughs> and you know how when you watch roller derby, it can get a little rough, but it's almost cartoonish. Well, right. this is not that. This is absolutely people are trying to kill you. Right. And there is a game there. You have to put this ball in this like slot after you're going right. around and around and everyone's trying to stop you from doing that. And so that's the goal, but they will stop you in almost any way. And like Larry said, there are some rules, but what they do is they don't really change the rules. They just eliminate the rules. Yes. That's right. yes, yes. So now there's nothing, there's nothing to stop you from doing anything. And the game I think can go on as long as yes. you wanted to. No time, do, no, no time limit. No time limit. And right. you can kill whoever you want at any point. And there are no time. No outs. substitution. No substitution. Yeah. It's like the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Comedy God. ripped from the front page. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's good, uh, though, yeah. the way that it's the story is structured, too. You get this moment of truth with Jonathan E. where it's, am I going to retire? Am I going to play the game? And if he retires, he's going to go off to a fairly pleasant life. He's going to oh, yeah. never really yeah, want yeah. for anything. No. And they keep they keep sending him new wives. But of course he hates right. all of them. Right. But no, that's not how he wants to do it. And the way that movie ends is so haunting and perversely uplifting. Yeah. You know, also the bleakness of it and the way it presents the different classes. It's a good double feature with Soylent Green too. Yeah. Because the yes. way they show the elite classes, how they're so removed from what the reality of what's going right. on in the world. Yes. And just the bleakness of the dystopian society. It's kind of like a good double feature at that film. You, you know, the other thing about it too, which is very, very powerful. Norman Jewison does a, an amazing job. Maybe not a guy known for action. But no. he does such a phenomenal job of yeah. covering every part of that track. But yeah. even more so, the thing yes. that I find very frightening is it takes place in the arena and the crowd, the cr crowd feeds off the violence in yeah. this pit <clears throat> and almost to like a frenzy. And it's like you think of the mob mentality of getting excited about seeing you know, you're getting into the violence, then you see someone else get hit, and yeah, you want to jump on top of it. And that society that it's created is terribly frightening. Yeah, and um, they are yeah. they are violent fans. Like they're violent. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, there's a yeah. fence surrounding it, but even so, like one fan climbs over, you know, thinking, you know, it's like that idiot who runs on the baseball on field. On the field, right? right. Like, yeah. Right, right. Like a moment of fame, you know, yeah, where yeah. a policeman will tackle you here. You get hit and you, you get, get hit killed. and killed. Not, not so <laughs> smart. The other thing that Norman Jewson does is that he makes it operatic in the yeah, way yeah. that the game is played. Because yeah. the use of music like oh. uh, Takata and Fugue in D minor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Classical. Uh, classical music just playing over this game where, you know, in the hands of someone else today... I didn't even get through the remake, but you know, it would not be done that way. This right. is, it, it feels like 
it's still within that time of when there was real filmmaking and and it didn't matter yeah. you know that this was a, a science fiction concept it was treated with sincerity and respect and well, yeah. that's the beautiful thing about science fiction in the 70s pre star wars is that you did have these dystopian futures where there was a kind of a, a hint of a utopia in some cases but always at a huge price like in logan's right. run Yes. And it was yeah, always yeah. really thoughtful and really sensitive and not all that sensational. And there was so much care put into these, but they, they weren't necessarily treated as A pictures. They were still sci-fi, but they were good pictures, even Westworld. Well, yeah, Westworld. Yeah, yeah. Westworld, yeah. The original Westworld is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like I think it's I think in a lot of ways, it's a perfect movie. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny you should say that because I wrote it down as an arena film because the whole carousel thing. Oh, Logan's in, Run. In Logan's Run. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Logan's Run, right. Yeah, you're right in a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, Absolutely it, think about right. it, yes. for, for Logan's Run, we, if, I, mean, I know listeners know the story. It's like oh, in this utopian society, when you get to 30, you have a little crystal that starts blinking and you need to report to this carousel where you're renewed. And so there's a, it's a stadium. And so these people who are 30 are in this little circle and it starts to spin and y they start, you know, floating in air. It's like, oh, cool. And everyone starts yelling, yeah, this is great. Renew, renew. And there's this zap and they kind of vanish. You think, oh, they've been turned to a little baby. They've been renewed. Were they really turned into a baby? <laughs> or were right, they right. just zapped into non-existence? And right. but that's a whole that's a whole arena sequence. I right, have it's that a whole down. big spectacle. No, that's that, that is a very this. good choice. And but, speaking of that 70s vibe when it came to science fiction that uh, James was talking about, now you've got Logan's Run, which a lot of people look at as silly today. Because of all the fashions, well, they have that kind of sure, 70s sure. flair to sure, them. And, yeah. Sure. And, uh, but yeah. but I think especially the carousel scene is so beautifully done yeah. and and really pulls you in and makes you uncomfortable. And there is a game to it. Like you you get the idea that you're supposed to reach that big red crystal on the top and then you win. I mean, that's yeah. what I thought as a kid. Something. But everybody was trying for this thing yeah. and everybody's cheering them on. They don't want them to die. They want them to live, which is an interesting juxtaposition yeah. from a lot but of other it, films. But isn't it, they don't, right, don't, right. They, don't they vanish? They vanish, right? When they, they get, well, they, well they the, no, you know, you in know the what TV is, series, in yes. the TV series, they're vaporized. Yeah. But in the movie, they're blown up and you never yeah. see what really happens to the bodies. Yeah. Like yeah. sparkle is like, they, they, yeah, they kind of explode. You're right. They kind of they soften explode. it for the TV series. Yeah. That's a great choice, Larry. I yeah, forgot I like about that. that. That was directed yeah. by Michael Anderson. And, you know, it's funny. It's a completely after the whole Star Wars thing, you know, that whole science fiction really changed. But, you know, I really like the whole Logan's Run look. And me too. And well, that, yeah. That, and, and for deck, I mean, for literally decades, they were trying to remake, re, you know, reimagine Logan's Run. Because I, I do think if done right, though, with the right person, the right director who appreciates the source material, you could do a cool new version of Logan's run, but you know, I don't know. We'll so let me ask that. you this then guys. Now, have any of you read the books? I have not. No, the books are great. I've read them all. William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson did the original book. And then William F. Nolan then went on to do the sequels and they're all pretty interesting, but what's different in the book than in the movie is that it's not a dome city. It's the entire world. Oh, Oh, and, okay. and, wow. and, the, and the difference also is that you don't die at 30. You die at 21. <gasps> no. But see, yeah. but see, that one makes sense today because today if yes. they made the movie, they would do it that with a younger cast. So Right. And yeah. for, okay. once it, for, for once it would be appropriate. Yes. Yes. You're right. <laughs> right. Interesting. Okay. Cool. Yeah, this, this may sound kind of weird, but one of the arena films that I thought of, my first thought was star trek but then i thought of this other film and it had the very special it was a very special moment when i saw it in the movie theater and it's from 1980 flash gordon of uh, course this is the one to yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a sequence and people may forget about the sequence but it's like prince baron is not a fan of this guy flash gordon okay <laughs> right and so <laughs> It, long story short, they kind of get to Voltan, the, the guy with the big wing, the, his palace, 
and the Baron and Flasher gonna have it out on this this circular pedestal. Okay, the, yes, the yeah, giant. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and the first thought when I saw it was, oh my gosh, you know, there's like nothing around it, and they they might fall off as the battle begins. The circular platform, so maybe it's about you know twenty by twenty in a you know raised circle. It starts to move and teeter like it's got a ball underneath it. So you're kind of losing your balance. And so, okay, so now you have to fight each other on this spinny thing. And then to make matters worse, Volton presses a button which has these spikes come out, you know, uh, with no pattern. They're all so you could fall down and have a spike go through you. And, and as a kid watching this, I went, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I really thought, it, like an idiot, I'm like, oh, my God, Flash is going to get impaled. You know, no, <laughs> of course it's not going to. But it's a really neat sequence. I agree. I, I, I do and, really like that scene especially. And then, yeah, look, yeah. You, 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 <laughs> Sam, Jones, Sam Jones, you know, maybe not the most dynamic actor, but you have – Timothy Dalton, who does, who's a great Prince Baron. Who's great in everything. And yeah, 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 but but when they do this fight, it's it's really exciting. And but also, also, it's the simplicity of that. Like the nowadays, like it would, it would be so elaborate, and like yes. it's, it's just just a teetering base with a spike. That's it. But like you really, you're like you're you're you believe it. Edge of your, you're on the edge of your seats. Like shit. You know, like, well, it's, it's good. It's, you know, it's funny, Sean. That whole sequence. I love the Queen music. I love the different look of it. It was not yeah. Star Wars, which is right, one of the right. things I, I I loved both. I love Star Wars and I love Flash Gordon, but that sequence is like embedded in my brain. I just remember watching that, just going, "Oh my god!" And you're right; it's the simplicity of it, Sean. Yeah, yeah. Th that uh, and you're right. I think if it were remade today, they would have spikes everywhere. It would be, it would be like so elaborate. It would be and, too yes. much. It would be yeah, way I mean, too much. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and yeah. you don't need it. You don't need it. No, and, no, and no. It's and it was you know Voltan was there with all this Hawkman. They're all and they're laughing. They're laughing. At yeah, the, yeah. A uh, Flash and and Baron. It's, there's this. It's a great sequence. Oh, Brian Blessed so that with was the, one, the best laugh and show business oh my oh my god yeah <laughs> right yeah. so that was one of the arena scenes that came to my mind yeah yeah i like that. that hey sean you turned me on to a movie called arena i was just gonna bring 1989 that one up. I, lo I love this movie okay so there is a tell, movie. tell the Wait. folks about it yes so this is this is like really to me kind of like the peak of charles band's empire <laughs> pictures because this movie looks really good. It's it a good. real budget. It's kind of like a little bit like a Babylon 5 situation where basically it's this intergalactic space station with all these different species of aliens living amongst themselves. And there's this popular fighting tournament where uh, all these uh, different aliens fight each other. And they're, they're like cool monsters. These are guys in suits yeah. fighting each other. And it's a hugely popular thing. But human fighters never do well. Like they, no. They're always killed me. But there's this one guy. He's a good fighter. And he He's a, he's a human fighter, and he gets to fight these aliens. He does really well. But then you find out that, you know, the guy running the tournament is crooked, and, you know, he's he's fixing the whole game. But, but the movie is really fun. You got, it you is. got uh, speaking of Babylon 5, you got Claudia Christensen in it. Yeah. You got Ar Armin Shimmerman. Jack Carter is in it. It was directed by Peter Manugian, who also directed Demonic Toys and Eliminators with uh, Denise Crosby. And it's just a lot of fun. Like I said, it's quite elaborate and quite a big production for an Empire Pictures film. And uh, it's great. It's a lot of fun. And then you've also got Mark Elamo, who is yeah, Joel yeah. Ducat from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That's and, right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you've got a lot of familiar faces. And I think you really hit it on the nose. I mean, they really got a lot of bang out of their buck with this. Yeah, it looks yeah. way better than you would think it would for what they yeah. spent. It's quite an epic for Empire pictures and speaking of babylon 5 there's also a first season episode of babylon 5 called tko which was like this disgraced human boxer who uh wants to get his uh mojo back so he fights and like this kind of secret tournament of aliens that fight on, on babylon 5 it's kind of like a cage fight thing that happens and garibaldi is a friend of his and he you know he doesn't want his friend to fight but he uh, he actually fights these aliens uh in the in the match but so there's a little connection there to that show but uh but yeah arena you're expecting to get sheep looking empire film from the time it's not that it's probably their best looking big budget sci-fi film really yeah. fun so if boxing Sure. Is considered an arena event. Yeah, then it wouldn't 
wouldn't the Twilight Zone episode Steel Ooh, fit in this? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. And yeah. where's that figure, by the way? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Battling yeah. Maxo. Yeah. Paul That's Jason right. Lindsay. Paul Jason <laughs> Lindsay. That's right, yeah. And if you don't know this episode, it's Lee Marvin. He is Tim Steel Kelly, and he's got this robot, and that's what prize fights are now. They don't, you know, they don't want to hurt anybody, so now robots fight. And he's got this robot named Battling Maxo, and Battling Maxo is on its last legs. Like, it's fucked up. It's been knocked mm -hmm. around way too many times. But they can't really afford to buy a new robot. And they've got all kinds of debt. Him and his partner, Joe Mantell, they're trying to make as much money as they can, but it's really over for them. And there's this great thing that happens where Maxo finally fizzes out and Lee Marvin has to take his place in the ring <laughs> against a robot that can't be hurt. It's about as good as... I mean, the Twilight Zone really was a bar of excellence. And this is one of the classic episodes uh written by richard matheson based on his original story and the one thing i really loved about this particular episode was the robot is so creepy it's a it's it's yeah. really a basic look it's just really a mask with these black eyes but it's so unnerving but chuck hicks as battling maxo really brings that character to life you should all yeah, watch it good please one. watch I it like for it. me hey i got a horror one Okay. Yes. 2005, George A. Romero's Land of the Dead. Oh, where, uh, oh yeah. Good one. But it good is also one. this dystopian future where the yes. zombies are with human beings in society learning to live together. They're and kind of evolving. Yeah. Evolving. And you've got the heroine, Asia Argento, is placed in an arena in a small uh, fighting ring with two zombies. So the odds are kind of against her. Right. And she is outmatched. And, you know, like, like a lot of these types of sequences, actually, like a lot of sequences in Land of the Dead, something is set up and you think, like, oh, this is going to have a great payoff. And it doesn't. Because, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because yeah. the hero shows up and he just shoots the zombies in the head. I, and that's um, no fun. That's no fun. And, and Land of the Dead is no fun, period. Yeah, for me, it was a huge. <laughs> yeah. I'm with, uh, I, I hate to say it, but yes. Yeah. I still, still a lot of things I like about it, but it's, of course, it's not his best. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But first of all, they're the cleanest fucking zombies of any Romero movie. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, well, it's supposed and, to be and, evolving, I guess. So. They're, well, what? They're, evolving they're so they wash their clothes? Yeah. They're, they're showering now. <laughs> 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 right. Um, I would say on a, on a smaller scale, there is certainly a, an arena type scene in John Carpenter's Escape from New York. When right. Oh, sure. He yeah, has yeah. to fight that guy. You know, I mean, the Duke, you know, puts him in the yeah. in that little ring to fight that thing. guy. Yeah. Slag. It looks, yeah. Yeah. I it love that like fight. It looks like it's Grand Central Station, although it probably yeah. isn't the actual Grand Central yeah. Station because they shot the whole thing in like Kansas City. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But I love that fight. And I love the way Snake gets, yeah, kills the guy in that scene. It's awesome. Yeah. That's <laughs> great. Yeah. Ox Baker played Black. <laughs> nice name. <laughs> yeah. Where has he been at Monster Palooza or anything like <laughs> yeah. that? I, I love the Ox. Probably. I love Ox Baker's work. <laughs> <laughs> the retrospective is coming to <laughs> right. the Egyptian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nice. if if we shift over to the Marvel universe, you have from 2017 uh -huh. for yes. Ragnarok. Yes, of course. Uh -huh. has, uh, and it look, uh, See, I, I had a lot of fun with that movie. I, I do movie. enjoy seeing if, that sequence where you, Thor gets yes, Hulk. There, for listeners, if you haven't seen it, if you've been living under a rock, there's a whole sequence which everyone has been waiting for. It is a giant stadium where Thor battles the Incredible Hulk. Mm, and yeah. I think it's a great sequence. And I, look, I love Chris Helmsworth as uh, Thor. Me too. And I like and him too. He's great. I, I, think, I, I think it's cast really well. And, when he's and, directed well, yeah. And, and, and Ruffalo, who plays the Hulk in his human form, is, gri is great too. But mm. that whole battle sequence that they have within the stadium is great because everyone expects the Incredible Hulk, who is the champion, to defeat this puny guy. But it's a, it's a great sequence where Thor really gives Hulk, uh, you know, uh, a round for his money, would you say? So right, right. that's a movie that we were talking about movies to get better 
as you watch them again? That's <laughs> one that gets worse. No, oh. no, no, not to me. It's I, still, I, it's still, okay, still on. This, this is I'm my opinion channel, now. No, if I this is channel, my I come across it and I say, oh, oh. This is my this? opinion now, mm-hmm. and I understand that people can have differing opinions. But for me, see, I read a comic called Planet Hulk, and it was in 2006. It was written by Greg Pak, and the Hulk is sent to this planet because he's just too much of a wild card. So the other heroes, how are they going to deal with the Hulk finally? They're going right. to just shoot him off into space. And the ship lands on this planet, and it's like a gladiatorial planet. Right. And there are these games, and they've captured a bunch of aliens from various races. And in the comic... The Silver Surfer is one of the heroes that they capture, but it's done very seriously. And the Hulk finally is in an environment where he can thrive to the point where he becomes the leader of the planet and he gets a wife and it's so good. And then there's Ragnarok. (laughs) <laughs> Which is a lighthearted romp. Woohoo! It's, one more it's fun. fucking I hilarious know. time. Look, this was the turning point. This was during that phase where apparently we're not supposed to take any of this seriously anymore. And so yeah. the Hulk is a big goof. And personally, I'm not a big fan of Mark Ruffalo. I like him as Bruce Banner okay. When he's the Hulk and they, they give him that Mark Ruffalo face. Terrible. Yeah. I just, I don't like it. I, I love, I love, it. I love, love it. Jeff Goldblum. Love he's great. And I like what he's doing. It just doesn't fit. Wait, let me, let me, let me counter that. I guess it does fit because the whole movie is for a laugh. And so he's doing it for a laugh. So uh, nothing is taken seriously. There's no real drama and it's all just a big send up. And I, when I first watched it, I got some laughs out of it. I didn't hate it or anything. I still don't, hate it now, but it's a giant disappointment. And I know that I am in the minority, but the difference between me, I guess, and you guys is the fact that I really like superheroes and you guys think that it should be a big send up, a big oh, wait, laugh. Matt, Matt, hold Let's on, all big laugh. Hey, Here we go. Hey, 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 I'm hey, the grenade. Hey, Here we go. Uh, Matt, Matt, first of all, you're <laughs> saying, you're saying you guys, I'm an absolute, and I, I've always been in absolute agreement with you. It wasn't really. That. I but, wasn't really. Uh, <laughs> but I agree that Ragnarok was a disappointment. Love and Thunder was a fucking disaster. Well, we yeah. can, that, this that, is where we all movie, make up again. Yeah. That movie I genuinely hate. You know, but see, it, it, I feel that Ragnarok was why we got Love and I, Thunder. I agree. Yes. I agree. It was the, Taika it was the Waititi. path. Taika Waititi. Yeah, I know. He decide, he's, he's decided, no matter what his talents are, making other movies and other, other franchises, he's decided when he does a Marvel film, it's all a big joke. You're right. And that's the terrible, terrible Wait, way to do it. In fairness, yeah. Sean, in fairness, it's not his decision. It's Kevin Feige's decision. And I, 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 I would blame Feige for that. And Matt, look, I loved your explanation of the comic book that you read and look, Matt, I, I didn't read that comic. Okay. I'm and, and hearing you tell that, that story is really, really neat. So what I know of the Hulk is what I saw on television with Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno. And so seeing this, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with it. And I understand that. I do understand your disappointment and your dislike for it because it could have been so much more. I didn't know all that history. And that's and, fair. You know, and, and, you know, it's yeah. funny, Matt. You wonder with Endgame, you know, it's it's so heavy. Those two, those two films are so heavy. I'm almost wondering if the feeling was we need to make something a little light going into Maybe. those things. I don't know the decision why. I'm just – you're right, Matt. I, I think – Many people who are in, who love the Marvel universe like that film because it is a little bit more lighthearted and and you know Sean I I'll have to tell you uh, when we talked about the Love and Thunder I was the one who was ah oh, I, I I like to eat my popcorn after seeing it a second time it you know it it's not one that I like to watch over and over again. Oh, okay. I, I, I would never I would never watch I would never watch a minute of that movie again. And I yes. I, 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 I couldn't just, get through I, it. Yeah, I'm I know. I'm not. Yeah, it's it's terrible. It's I mean, I I, I know what you mean. I, I, I do see Ragnarok as the start of that trend. I really hope they correct it. I mean, I don't know what the hell they're going to do with you know the MCU at this point, but I hope they if they're going to keep making them, I think they should 
go a little more serious and more respectful of the source material. But wait a minute. So here's here's where I'm wrong, and that is with the success because Thor Ragnarok was a big success. Huge. Yeah, I know. Huge. And so success. I'm not. I am not the audience. Yeah. The audience is people who want it to be a big joke. But I think I think no, there's I, an argument yeah. to, to reappraising things in hindsight. And after Love and Thunder, I can look back on Ragnarok and say, okay, well, this was the beginning of going in the wrong direction. And and now I like Ragnarok less because of Love and Thunder. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, I understand. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Also, I have a very soft spot in my heart for the Hulk. The Hulk is really one of my favorite characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Hulk and Submariner. Submariner was ruined in a lot of ways. <laughs> oh my god, yes he was. I, and I can't even. It's too complex to even deal with right now. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But uh, but they ruined the Hulk because. What finally happened when you get to She-Hulk is now he's not even the Hulk anymore. Now he's Mark Ruffalo being smarmy and whatever. And <laughs> it's not my – it's not the Hulk. The Hulk is a monster. And the right, best right. – I would say – so now Eric Bana, that was a misfire. I think we all agree on yes, that. Yes. That didn't work at all. But when they got Edward Norton, that is one of my favorite Marvel movies of all time. And I'm, yeah, that's and really I'm, in, the minor, I'm in the minority. Because a lot of people don't like that for whatever reason. But I thought Edward Norton was great in that. And I guess he was just so difficult to work with or whatever yeah. the problem yeah. was that they couldn't go on with him. Which is a shame because it would have been really interesting to see him continue on through that whole series. But right. when they we get to the Avengers, the very first Avengers film, mm-hmm. and you've got Ruffalo. I think that was the best Ruffalo has been as the Hulk. Yeah. And, and as Bruce Banner. There was, yeah, a, yeah. He still had that kind of uh, soft-spoken quality about him, yeah, yeah. and and then when he became the Hulk, he was different. He didn't look like Mark Ruffalo. He looked like the Hulk, and yeah, he was yeah. a monster. And there is some humor in that first Avengers movie that is so funny, where Thor is trying to make friends with him, and all he does is just punch him in the face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so fun. And that, well, that, that movie, that's, that's yeah, character driven that, humor, right? Yes, there. yeah. Well, that first Avenger movie is kind of perfect. It, was, it is like, perfect. It, it, yes. It's like you saw that and it was like, wow, they got it right. You know, Finally, all the, they get it all right. All the single films, and then they had that one. It's like, wow. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, but do, as, I do want, I do want the Mark Ruffalo Hulk action figure, but it's become way overpriced. So I don't know if I'm ever going right? to be able to get it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Just a, yeah. I don't know what happened. Well, How, when did that come out? Back, I guess, when uh, maybe when Avengers came Was out, it, or maybe oh. uh, Endgame, or yeah. But the, huh. the point, the point of the whole this whole Marvel discussion was in Ragnarok, <laughs> regardless of how you felt. There is a great sequence that has an arena in it, and I, I yeah, enjoyed sure. that. That was a fun. That was a fun one. Hey, um, you guys are talking about Frederick Brown and the different versions of his story. I have to mention one other, I think just very loosely based on this. It's basically another ripoff of that idea, but it's from the terrible second season of Space 1999. <gasps> um, there is an episode oh. called the, there's an episode called the the Rules of Luton. And I'm, I'm just going to read I'm, I'm going to read I'm going to read I don't read know you, this. I want to read you the the little blurb from IMDb of the episode. Okay? Please. Commander Koenig and Maya are exploring a planet called Luton, which is lush in vegetation. She picks a flower and he helps himself to some fruit. As a result, they are put on trial for murder by three talking trees, the judges of Luton. <laughs> the, the, the trial is by combat and the pair must face three aliens, one with super strength one that can render itself invisible and one that can teleport. So it's basically just another arena episode. It's so fucking stupid. <laughs> it's like they're literally it's like these three trees talking to them. You have, you have def- defiled our planet and you must oh face. It's, it's, this is, this, it was, is the, this is the second season. This is a little, season. little bit of trivia for you. Uh, I've never, this, I've never heard of this. No, terrible. little trivia for you. This episode was originally an episode of HR puff and stuff. And then what they did, <laughs> is they just changed the names around. And wow. the, the aliens are so ridiculous looking, which, which was a, a big factor of yeah, the second season. Yeah. They're like, uh, they're, they're like terrible. far out space nuts. Aliens. It really is. It's, it's so, I mean, it, now, that, now this, this sounds like one you take edibles and then watch. Yes. Yeah. That's the only way to get through it. It's the show was so off the rails by the second by season. By then. Yeah. And that yeah, is, it's just true. terrible. It's just awful. <laughs> 
That's hey. a great one. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, Sean, I want to know if you remember this one. Okay. This is this is kind of out of left field, and it's not a big <laughs> sequence, but it's something I always remembered, and it happens to take place in an arena that's televised. Okay. And this is from 1979 television, Battlestar Galactica, the game Triad. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, Where they dress nice. in those ridiculous so, outfits. So, yeah. so for listeners, <laughs> if you're not familiar with yes. this, as a kid watching, I'm going, what the hell? Is it? So, <laughs> so it's played by four people, you know, two and two. And they're kind of dressed up in kind of half football pads. I know. But they're kind <laughs> of playing basketball. And they yeah. all start out holding hands, going in the circle. It, it's I'm ridiculous. Watching, going, what the hell is this? But <laughs> uh, the, it's the, the future. Character, the character Starbuck is one of the tough guys on right, this right. triad thing. And, you know, it starts out with this stupid game. And it, it's not that the focus of the episode. No, no. It's right, but, right. But it's it's watched by because it's all the spaceships are trying to find Earth. So this yeah. game is being televised. Yeah, yeah. Other. And, and it's, right. just, it's just so ridiculous. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, guys, Gina loves that guys, one. Gina loves that one. Guys, we should yeah. cosplay that. <laughs> triad. <laughs> triad players. From it's, yeah. it's, it's just, it, but, and listeners, if you if you, you like, you can actually go on YouTube, put in Battlestar Galactica you know, Triad, and you right, right. see some clip. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. But you know what, Sean? I've always remembered that sequel of all yeah, the yeah. episodes. I'm like, right. oh man, I thought, it, you know, you think it'd be like a tougher game? It wasn't that <laughs> tough, and they were trying no. to be tough. It, was just, it looks pretty it's, ridiculous. Yeah, it's that's a good one. Are any of the Tron games would that be considered a yeah arena kind game? of oh kind well, of sure yeah especially yeah. especially Tron Legacy because you see like the crowd you know yeah that, except oh, it's okay. multi level yeah. when they do the fight the battles and yeah that's yeah that could be absolutely um I I, I would say even Army of Darkness when Ash has to fight the creature in the well yeah they're all kind of all oh, cheering kind of yeah. 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 yeah 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 I, exactly. I felt like that was more of an execution than yeah uh, yeah that's true I guess so, but I yeah. guess but I mean you, you could compare that to the Christians to the lions kind of a thing so. right right yeah. right you know, well, executions can take place in an arena too um, yeah. I'm think true. I'm thinking of the the climax of again Stephen King's The Stand where in Las Vegas Randall Flagg <sighs> has uh -huh. um, Ralph Brentner mm. and Larry Underwood in cages in front of the Golden Nugget Hotel with the entire you know post apocalyptic survivors of Vegas to witness their deaths their right, slow right. and painful deaths by dismemberment yeah that's true that's true. Okay, well, if that's the case, then what about the Wicker Man? Yeah, Ooh. yeah. I guess well, it's more like a ritual, but it's I guess more you of could a ritual, see it. but uh, yeah. but it it is a it is a good time for the town. <laughs> yeah, whenever you're gathering <laughs> yes. the entire town. Yeah, you're right. A spectacle, a spectacle. Yeah, a spectacle. Right. yeah. and I bet there was well, some yeah. bedding. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, <there was> some... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe maybe this doesn't exactly fit, but I I thought it wasn't necessarily televised. But what about in James Bond, Man with a Golden Gun, it's the sequence towards oh, the Oh, yeah. Well, because Nick Knack's kind of overseeing it. He you know? is. Oh, and, and, yeah. so, and, and so it's a, yeah. an event yeah. between this guy who is the ultimate hitman and James Bond. Through right. this yeah. giant they send him game this type menagerie thing. of, yeah. What do, you, what do you think, James? Would that, no? Well, you know, actually, Man with the Golden Gun came to mind, but I was thinking of the big sumo sequence and and trying to remember that. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think Bond was directly involved in that, but I, I was trying to come up with a James Bond connection. Yeah, yeah, it was a right. little hard, but um, right. You know, one thing, one thing I think we should at least give mention to is Game of Thrones. I was just going to say, there's a, oh. several brutal arena yeah. type scenes in that. Yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah, 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 yeah. There's one from season five called The Mountain and the Viper. Where the yeah, mountain, that's the one. I remember. Speaking of master blaster, the mountain is this huge, yeah. you know, hulking mast. Never speaks, and he's the um, enforcer for Cersei Lannister. Right, and he has this uh, huge fight against Prince Oberyn, played by Pedro Pascal, who's so uh, cocky and, 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 so, and you know, everybody yeah. likes him. Everybody yeah, and he's, yeah. and he's, he thinks he's, he's got it in the bag, man. <laughs> too but, but, cocky. No, too has, cocky. It's one of those things where look. You know, you could chop this guy's head off right now. And instead, he's doing this little dance, this victory yeah. dance, like, yeah. like, oh, yeah, it's like, dude, what are you doing? And then, he, and then he, when, he, you know, the mountain wakes up and spoiler, you know, kills him. It's Bad like, all mistake. right, you fucking deserved it, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that, that, was, that like, was good. That was, 
There were a few. There's another one where um, Sir Jora is fighting for the honor of Daenerys in a big arena match. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Right. He's, he's outmatched and he almost bites it. And then he gets, uh, he's saved at the end by someone who, someone else who wants to kill him. And then they fight Ooh. to the death. But yeah, there, and there's, there's more than that. There's plenty in Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah. Full, I it's forgot all about those. that. That's a, that's a great one. That yeah. is, that's a great one, James. Hey, yeah. are you guys, are you guys fans of the movie Idiocracy? Oh, yeah. Yes, for sure. Well, you know, I mean, that's a big arena scene at the end. Oh, that's right. Joe, played by Luke Wilson, he's through suspended animation, wakes up in the future where everybody's an idiot and he's the smartest <laughs> man alive. Yeah. And they have a problem because all their crops are dying because they keep pouring this drink called Brondo on it, <laughs> which has tons of electrolytes, which nobody under even understands what electrolytes are. And they're pouring all of this stuff on the soil and it's killing all the plants. And Joe decides, well, you know, I, maybe water would be a good thing to use. And <laughs> so he convinces President Camacho, who is this like big wrestler dude, who, by the way, may be a pretty great president. <laughs> in <comparison laughs> days to right. Others. Anyway, so, yeah, he promises he's going to turn everything around when it comes to the crops, but it doesn't happen fast enough. And so he is sentenced to be publicly executed at a monster truck demolition derby. <laughs> and he has to go up against the undefeated rehabilitation officer, Beef Supreme. <laughs> and I have to see that movie scene, again. It, it's, that is, I think, one of the best, certainly modern science fiction social commentary satires. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I agree. it's Because it hits the points and it's, genuinely hilarious yes and yes. uh i love it and that was a movie that kind of was buried for a while yeah and, yeah and then found a cult audience but yeah eventually the crops grow and everything's cool <laughs> but that scene is is genuinely exciting with all the monster trucks and everything they they, they right, do a yeah, very yeah. good job with that so i like when it one. comes to comedy i i'll take that one over uh ragnarok any day <laughs> sure well uh here's one here's a movie that you know i've actually come to like a lot more from when i initially saw it and that was from 1993 the coneheads film oh, oh the, great that's the, right yeah, the coneheads, oh, the cone, and the coneheads the last the last that. part of the movie is i love because it's it's a uh, beldar and primat go back to Remulac, the planet Remulac, where they're from, and where they meet the High Master, played by Dave Thomas. And something happens where Beldar, he he, uh, he offends them or something, so he's accused of treason. So because of that, the High Master orders Beldar to fight to the death in this arena against the Garthok monster, which is this awesome, you know, giant it's stop good. motion creature. It it's is. great. Yeah. It's great. And so Beldar, and, you know, we see the creature kill this other guy. He's like, oh, my God, how is Beldar going to get out of this? But because Beldar has been um, on Earth so long, he has all these different things he's learned from Earth. So he, he's a golfer. So uh, he actually uses his golfing skills to, like, uh, hit like a, a rock into the monster's mouth and it chokes and, and he, it kills him. So Beldar is pardoned, but the, the whole sequence is great. You get to see Remulac and, you know, it's a whole, it's just a whole gladiator, you know, spectacle scene where everybody's in the bleachers cheering on, you know, the monster to kill him. It's great. I had never seen that movie. And then I recently watched it and I was surprised at how funny it was. Yeah, and there's tons of comedic actors in it. Like it's it's a it's really good. It's like so, I don't know at the time. I mean, it came out in '93. Like when, like, do, like it didn't do well. No, because no. because well because the code ads were from the '70s and that's SNL. right. It's like it's, what it's like its time had passed. Yeah, it but now like it's it was like old. It was like old. And yeah, it's a shame because people didn't it's know fun. about that. That if I remember correctly, I don't think any of the the creature battle was in any of the advertisements. So a lot of people had yeah, no yeah. idea. I think would have been smart to show some of that, and that yeah, would or something. It, and, and Aykroyd and uh, Jane Curtin still look, look; they look exactly the same in the in the do, you know yeah. in the Conan Alpha. I mean, it's just it's really fun. Yeah. But what about the rest of the cast too? I mean, oh Michael my... McKean, yeah, David Spade, Chris Farley, Sinbad, Michael Richards, Eddie Griffin, Phil Hartman, Adam Sandler, Jason Alexander, Dave Thomas, oh. Lorraine Newman, Garrett Morris, Drew Carey. Kevin Nealon, Jan <laughs> Hooks, Parker Post. I mean, fuck. Yeah, it's wow. great. Yeah, yeah I, was, a good one. I was amazed. 
Yeah, that was a movie that was way better than I ever expected it to be. Yeah, I agree. And at the time, they even gave Dan Aykroyd the cover of Playboy with Pam Anderson. And it was very rare for a male to be on the cover of Playboy. Really? Wow. Uh, Interesting. There's only been a small (laughs) handful. We're so proud of him. (laughs) Well, we could go on and on and on. We could. You can't can't get rid of that. Once once you've done the... uh, It stays with you. It's the monster palooza exhaustion. Uh, It becomes part of it. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, we we really could. It's funny. We brought up, there were obvious ones, but then there were some that you guys brought up that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When you think about it, there's more than you think. Yeah. So why don't we do like a lightning round? Maybe, let's lightning maybe round. if you have a couple more, or left, a couple yeah. more out. Yeah. Who wants to yeah. jump in? Just go for it. Well, it, as far as animation goes, there's one sequence mm-hmm. from the 2014 film Big Hero Six, which I'm a fan of, and oh, Matt, yeah. I know you don't like it. I don't care. The for little it. kid here, I know. You know, y- you're missing out because it's a great <laughs> film. I watched the whole but thing. The, bri- the brilliant kid hero, he. He's a sharp kid. He's a bright kid. And he creates this little battling robot. You know, this was big back in the, you know, 90s and 2000s. You know, the battling robots were, you know, tech kids would get together and try to Mm -hmm. have their little robots beat each other up. Well, this kid's come up with a really brilliant way of going to these events and kind of fooling someone into thinking, oh, his robot's not very good. And they put down a lot of money. And and so there it's a spectator thing where you have a bunch of people surrounding him and the other competitor as their little bat- robots battle each other. And it's a great sequence. So there okay, you go. go on. Arena. Nice. There's an arena for you. Very yeah. nice. Well, what about the um, Dune films when you have Atreides fighting Fade? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's it's, a it's good like, one. You know, both it's in, in, in all versions. One. I mean, that's, you know, you have that. That's definitely a, an arena situation. Everybody's watching what the hell is going to happen. He's going to win here. You know, I would also throw in there's a an Italian film from the 80s directed by Lucio Fulci, actually. That's kind of like a sci fi action film called The New Gladiators, also known as Warriors <laughs> of the Year 2072. And basically, it's a running man. It's like this uh, corporation that's very corrupt and it televises these modern gladiator games, which happen on. Yeah, like a little bit of rollerball and running man all kind of combined. And it's uh it's kind of fun. Jared Martin's in it and Fred Williamson. And it's uh by Fulci, he usually does horror, but it's just kind of like a balls to the wall action violent sci-fi movie. So there you all go. All right. Nice. Well, uh, since I did bring up uh, Running Man and we're also talking about televised contests to the death, we should at least throw in Squid Game as a mention. Because that's oh, yeah. all fits Perfect. in with For sure, for sure. I would also throw in, this is not a genre film, but it's by a genre director, Ari Aster's Bo is Afraid, uh, where you've got Joaquin Phoenix going through a three-hour torture fest, and which finally at the end turns out that he's in the middle of an audience doing a referendum on whether he should be allowed to survive based on how cowardly he's been throughout his life. Kind of a Mm. shock ending. And then finally, Roger Corman's The Arena from 1973 starring Pam Ah. Greer. Yes. Ah! Ex- exploitation um sex uh action movie made in italy and remade in 2001 with two playboy playmates and i've told this story before uh <laughs> but whereas the arena was shot in italy the 1973 one the remake was shot in saint petersburg russia and i found myself with two playmates shooting <laughs> this thing in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> ended up somewhat single-handedly keeping them from walking off the set. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Nice. For you. And, and it is, I actually saw that the set and there was a little arena, uh, which is very much like the 1973 set of the arena. And okay. the story is actually very close uh, to the original. So um, yeah. And, and the ir- irony is that the director of the remake, Timur Betanetinkov from Russia Ended up directing movies in the U.S. like Wanted with Angelina Jolie, Abraham Lincoln vs. Vampires, and the 2016 remake of Ben-Hur. Wow. 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 Okay. It, all, it all comes He's around. Arena in his blood, I guess. But, yeah. but we have James Gonis to thank for keeping those playmates happy on that. That's right. <laughs> you That's save right. show business. It's thank right. you, James. Yeah, thank thank, thank you. you, James. A Pyrrhic victory, but there you go. <laughs> Matt, take us home. Okay. Well, you know, before all this MCU nonsense was happening to us, (laughs) 
There was a little series in the 60s called the Marvel Superheroes. Now, this was an animated television series that featured different Marvel comic superheroes in these various three chapter stories. And the thing about these cartoons was there was very little animation. What they did was they would just cut out things from comic books and just move them across a background. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it's so funny to watch, but it also is cool to see. It's sort of like, what do they call like a, a, a motion comic where, you know, you just move some elements, but it's, it's like you're watching a comic move. And so I think they're funny and I do enjoy seeing the original artwork Me too. Uh, that they were based on. And uh, it was produced by Gantre Lawrence Animation. And if you've never seen any of these, you, you got to find them. They're They're on the internet. You can find them on YouTube. But they did Captain America, they did the Incredible Hulk, they did Iron Man, the Mighty Thor, and the Submariner. I have a bunch of these on 16 millimeter, and they are a really good time. But there was one Submariner story called, it was three parts, it was called Let the Stranger Die to Destroy a Tyrant and Save a City. And the story is Submariner goes back in time to the Roman times, and is up against Nero and (laughs) Nero puts him in the gladiatorial ring and he has to fight a gladiator and he makes some allies. And there's a lot of what I would call kind of sexy torture scenes uh, (laughs) with Submariner voiced by the legendary John Vernon. Ah, nice. Dean (laughs) Wormer. And so, You know, you don't have to necessarily watch this particular cartoon. I think you should, but watch all of those Marvel superhero cartoons because, I mean, it really is a trip back in time of the way things used to be when we expected very little from our cartoons (laughs) and got it. it. (laughs) And a lot of them are on YouTube. A lot of them are on YouTube now, I think. Yes, yeah, and, yeah. They, and, they, and, they, and they all have the most the catchiest theme songs ever. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad you brought that up because each one, that's really the best part of the uh, yeah, cartoon yeah. is the theme songs. They're catchy. Yeah. When Captain America throws his, his mighty, mighty shield. shield. Yeah, just, all right, so those good. who chose to post his shield must you. Wow, look at you. <laughs> Can you go? Keep going. That's all I know. Well, <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh, yeah, it's great. I, yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, they're Mighty Thor. They What was that? All I remember for the Thor one was the God of Thunder, Mighty Thor. But there was a lot of production involved yeah, with these yeah. songs. They're not just someone playing an organ. Right, right. This was a this is these were big but, epic songs. Right, so. All the budget went to those. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, yeah that's a good fun. time. And then I'm gonna end with something that is some may say, oh well, is that's not really science fiction or horror. But I would say it kind of is because it falls in the category of spy fi. Mm-hmm. And that would be Enter the Dragon. The oh, 1973 yeah. oh, yeah. Bruce Lee oh, sure. martial arts classic directed by Robert Klaus. And this was Bruce Lee's big picture. This was like the yeah. big mainstream picture. And it's a classic. It's made so much money and Got yep. so much popularity <laughs> over the years. It also starred John Saxon yep. and Jim Kelly, who's an amazing martial artist. Mm-hmm. And this movie is so fun. There are so many arena fight scenes, and not just with Bruce Lee, but with other martial artists. Mm-hmm. And by the end, you've got this entire castle full of martial artists all fighting each other all at once. <laughs> and it, it is something to behold. Now, you got Bruce Lee, he's a spy, and he is infiltrating this martial arts tournament that is thrown by this crime lord named Han, who's involved with drug trafficking and prostitution. And so he's going to go in there, and he also wants to get at Han's bodyguard, who is a guy named O'Hara, who is responsible for his sister's death. And his sister is played by Angela Mao, who, I mean, she did a number of martial arts pictures on her own, Lady Kung Fu. And anyway, what happens is at one point, you've got Bruce Lee, mano y mano with Han. And Han at one point had his hand cut off. And so now he has 
this hand where he can put these different attachments on. <laughs> and there's one that's like a mace, and there's one that's just a steel hand. But the one that he uses, which is the one for the climax, is this hand that's like almost like a Freddy Krueger hand. It's got these yeah, yeah. blades. And he's going after Bruce Lee and a hall of mirrors. And it's just, it's so much fun. It's cool. Yeah. And then the music is terrific. Lalo Schifrin. Yeah. And just great. There's also a lot of people in that movie that you don't even realize are there. Samuel Hung is also in the picture. Apparently Jackie Chan uncredited is in the movie. Oh. If I was to tell you to see one Kung Fu movie, I would send you to that one first. Because right. it's kind of got everything. Nice. So there you have it. All right. Wow. wow. A lot of arenas. A lot of arena arenas. of titles. Yeah. Arena Palooza. Arena. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh. done in an arena. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, once again, this has been fun. Yeah, and we could been. go on and on. Yes. That's right. We really could. But we'll save that for a, another episode. And I know that there are a bunch of arenas. I'm sure we've missed some. Yes but, yes. but I think we did a pretty good job. I think we did yeah, a pretty good yeah. job at a, a nice overall selection of yes. great arena films. So I'm sure whatever, we, whatever we've missed, our listeners will let us know. Yes, they yes. will. Don't yes. be shy. I mean, we yeah. can take it. Yeah. And uh, if we disagree with you, we'll meet you in the arena of differing opinions. <laughs> Time for a listener shout out. Shout out. Thumbs shout up out or thumbs down. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to listeners, it's always thumbs up. That's right. Um, <laughs> well, nice. You know, coming from, you know, the memory of Monster Palooza is still fresh. And I, I want to mm -hmm. give shout outs to the listeners that we uh, met there and spoke to there. You know, in particular, Randall Perkins. Uh, oh, Picasso yeah. the Mundane, who drove all yes. the way from Vegas just to meet with us and brought right. us brought us whiskey and did Come shots on. in the Monster yeah. Party shot glasses that he purchased. Uh, I mean, right. he was he was so cool, and it was so great to meet him in person and his wife. Yeah. Well, and you know what? It's weird because I don't know what he put in that stuff, but <laughs> I I passed out and then suddenly woke up in his hotel room, which was <laughs> weird. Uh, what did you that put in that awesome. straight whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> a cheap date. <laughs> also, of course, Adam G. Hall is coming all the way from oh, New Hampshire. How great yeah. is it to see Adam? Yes. So great. Um, Always great to see him. And he uh, never comes empty handed. He brought us great Godzilla comics this time. And yep. um, <laughs> we had a great turned... conversation, too. Yeah. 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 That was really yeah. fun. <laughs> and um, he, he, he actually um, clued me into some new uh, kaiju products that I didn't know about. So that you got Adam, too, right? Th that I actually scored, yes, on eBay afterwards. Nice. Which I wouldn't have known about otherwise. So thank you, Adam. And of course, Hasher House, oh. uh, body painter, listener, you know, wonderful friend that we've known all these years. This was the, the fifth best. year, fifth year that he lend his talents to body painting. Uh, Ruby is a beautiful model who's yes, Ruby second Lee. Time, second yes, time second Ruby time Lee. Ruby is with us, yes. And uh, Ruby Lee is, she really stunning. puts her all into it. She's stunning, cool. but handing out flyers and everything. We have so much footage of her that you can see. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> go to our Patreon. Patreon. Oh, That's right. Great yeah. and, stuff. And if, there's any, if there's any reason to get on Patreon, <laughs> Ruby if, you do it, if you want to see more <laughs> Ruby Lee. Uh, Thank hey, you, uh, Ruby Lee. Yes. Thank you, Ruby Lee. The, the masterpiece that Pasher did on Ruby in terms of body painting does not make good radio. You have to go on Patreon. Yes. And actually <laughs> yes. Right. Let's just say the work will follow you around the room. <laughs> right. I mean, we, we've put some photos on Facebook and stuff, but really, yes. you, you got to yes. see it in action. Video. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, Monster Palooza was a very special event. I think we can all agree. As I know, yes. of course, of course, Jim Moore. Jim Moore. Oh, yes. oh, yes. Jim Moore. Oh, of course. my gosh. Oh. Jim Moore. We love Jim Moore. More monsters. And we more always monsters. get to see him at the Monster Palooza show, so it's always a treat. It yes. is. It's always a delight. And once again, if you go on our Patreon, we have some footage in our recent Monster Palooza video where yes. he's playing a little, uh, I guess it would be a lightning round of... <laughs> The Monster Party Word Association Test. So 
Hey, uh, uh, right. we always love him. And he was one of our earliest fans. And I think he, he was. was the first yes. person we ever gave one of our bottle openers to. Ah, uh, yeah. So it, we love he, you, Jim. He, he, he has we given us him. gifts in the past, too. Amazing yes, gifts. Yes. God yes. Oh, yes. That we, you, we all, he's a good uh, man. I he treasure is a, he's my, a good my fan. Zardoz. <laughs> what? It made you like Zardoz? No, no. Remember, he gave us the Zardoz. Yes, yeah, no, I remember. That's one of my, I treasure that thing. It's yeah. one of my most prized possessions. It really Mine is. Too. We'll yeah, have to yeah. do an episode on Zardoz. I think we need to. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> we should. Invite on some really naysayers. Should. Yeah, I can wear my Zardoz mask. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. And well, Matt will wear the you, diaper. Jim. He'll wear the diaper. Thank you, Jim. I'm wearing one yeah. now. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. And then finally, our a longtime listener and past guest Scott Rogers, who did not make it to Monster Palooza, but he did reach mm-hmm. out, uh, letting us know that he enjoyed listening to the show uh-huh. on our podcast and enjoying it bar- vicariously. So, Scott, thank you yes. for that. And we do look forward to having you on again in the future. Of course. And of course, our cosplaying pal, Eric. Yes. 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 Every well, always, year. Not, always good to see him. Always good to see him. It always has a different costume for each day. Yeah. He was a yeah. magician. Awesome. He was a demon. And, the wizard. Uh, he was a wizard, wizard. too. And he, he was, was a wizard. Yeah. And yeah. And then I think the third day, he was a an accountant. Or what was what was no, it? No, <laughs> it went back to the wizard. He it went wizard to, again. Okay, wizard went again. Back to the wizard. Okay, but we always have a great time talking with uh, Eric, and it's just it's it, it's just so great that he he just embraces the whole monster world completely. Yeah, he loves so, it. Yep, yeah. and good <clears throat> time. And you know, it's also an opportunity for us to find uh, new listeners and meet new fans. And if and if any of you listening now has actually is doing so because you met us at monster palooza and stopped by our booth a special shout out to you and yes and well you know yes, glad, yeah. glad that you're listening and hope you'll continue to do so yeah well guys i have one extra special shout out that uh i've been wanting to tell you guys about and you guys know some of the backstory to it i won't get in too much detail but I think you guys remember that for our anniversary a few years ago before COVID, we went to see KISS, right? Oh, yes. 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 I remember that. Yes, their final tour. We got some great seats and it was fantastic. And then on top of that, Jake Johansson, friend of the show, Jake Johansson, oh. his wife is friends with KISS's tour manager. Wow. No way. So we were all scheduled to go backstage, but what happened was COVID hit and it was right before, I mean, literally days before everything shut down. Oh man. So we were like, I mean, we were walking to the backstage area and they're like, nah, they're not doing the meet and greet. I was like, oh Oh. man. But cut to my most recent birthday and Jake Johansson and his lovely wife, Belinda Weymouth, They say they have this special present for me. And so it takes some time to arrange a meeting. But we go over their house and they present to me these two giant slipcover cased volumes of Kissology. Kissology 1 and 2. Wow. Giant hardcover books. Oh, it's beautiful. Everything Kiss in them. I mean, volume 1 is all, you know, a lot of background stuff and, you know, from the early days. And then the Kissology 2 has a lot of their merchandising, which is all the kind of stuff that we love to talk mm-hmm. about and look at and everything. And a lot of great naked shots of groupies. So <laughs> no way. Wow. I, I swear to you. Volume 2, of course, the one with the groupies, is signed by Gene Simmons. Of course. Wow. <laughs> right? Okay, so it doesn't end there. No? I get these two volumes. One is signed by Gene Simmons, and then included with this, two picks from Gene and Paul from the tour, the end of the road oh, tour. Oh. These two bona fide, original, guaranteed, the real deal, kiss picks. Well, you would say, oh, if that were it, that would be amazing. That that would be like one of the greatest presents of all time. No, there's one more thing. There's one oh more detail. Oh my gosh, there's more? Yes. They present me with this 8x10 <laughs> photo of Gene Simmons, not in makeup, <laughs> looking looking cool and powerful and strong. And <laughs> it is it is signed to me, and it says, Matt, 
you're the rock star. <laughs> That's amazing. All the wow. best, oh Gene Simmons. Oh, wow. Kiss. Wow. You, you have to post that, Matt. I will. Yeah. I'm going yeah, to post yeah. a nice picture of all this stuff. And, 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 I've uh, always, and I've always said, you're the rock star. You're the rock star of this group. And uh, James and I were talking about that I may be rock star considering the amount of rock star that I drink. (laughs) (laughs) You are what you eat. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, come on. Yes. They presented all this stuff to me and I, I couldn't contain myself. I I almost wept. It was. You know, <laughs> what, that's, that's amazing that you're, you must be a good friend of those people. They, well, yeah. they're wonderful people and they've been good friends to us. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's the mutual admiration society, yeah. but, uh, but that was, that was incredible. So That's you know, awesome. I, I thought I had a nice, cool little kiss collection before, but now with this, I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, step back, wow. man. <laughs> <laughs> so now I am, I, from the moment that I received these presents, I've been, Rock and rolling all night and partying every day. Just to confirm, though, now, now is Kiss yeah. done? They're done. They're not. Are they touring still? Or are they done? No, too? no, that's it. That's it. So this, this, is it this, last, have- this last tour was the end of the road. So you basically have a piece of like the last, last. Yes, yes. Tour. Yeah, yeah. Now, wow. I, I hear they're going to be doing this thing where they use avatars. And I think ABBA has done something similar. And I don't really understand it. I guess it's a young person thing. I'm the one I think that's out of the loop on on this. But I wish them all the best, and I hope that it, it works for them. But I feel very privileged to have seen them twice during their end of the road tour and experienced it. It was Carrie's first Kiss concert, wow. and it blew her mind. And she <laughs> constantly talks about feeling the intensity of the heat. From where we were sitting, our seats were that great, where you could feel the heat from the stage every time there was an explosion. And I think wow. her her quote was, I think that's the most explosions in a concert I've ever experienced. And I go, <laughs> you're damn right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, that's a great uh, well, I mean, yeah. end of the road tour is is a good name, but as I told you, Matt, I thought that the, for their final tour, they should have called it "Kiss Goodbye." <laughs> well, wow. well it's, it's good. It is good. It's 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 poetic. <laughs> but it may you not really have. Think it, so? it may, you really it thought may, that was poetic? <laughs> it's poetic, but it, I, do, yeah. I think it does lack the oomph. Yeah, yeah I'll give it that. It's too yeah. simple and easy. That's uh, not clever. Sorry, Jeff. Wow. <laughs> Oh, you, could do you, know, you could do better. They'll if if they ever do an Eagles thing and be like, oh no no no, one more tour, one more tour, then they can call it Kiss Goodbye. So well, you heard they, it, you heard it here first. I would love it, and you know <laughs> there are a number of bands that I've experienced where every other year is a farewell concert. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think back in like. The 80s, I went to the Dams farewell concert, and I think right now they're on tour in England. So, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I guess it didn't stick. <laughs> well, or maybe they're just yeah. finishing out their tour. It's just taking them. It's a long, yeah, yeah, long, yeah, it's a long, yeah, long tour. tour. Yeah, yeah, tours could take a lot out of you, but uh, anyway. Oh, so a lot of these people, they pass away. You know, the Monkeys is now just the monkey. The Doors is now just the door. The door. Gosh, like, you're right. You know, it's they're on their last gasp. It's you know, what are you gonna do? That's gonna be quite the the fan cruise. Oh. The, the last <laughs> the last member of every band. <laughs> wow. Oh wow. Wow. Now you I'm depressed. Think? Okay. Oh. But hey, I just want to once again thank Jake Johansson and Belinda Weymouth for this wonderful present. And you guys are the best. And thank you so much. And you guys are the rock stars. And hey, if you want to follow Percasso the Mundane's example and purchase four Monster Party shot glasses and bring it to us at the convention to do <laughs> shots with us, well, you might ask yourself, where can I buy these shot glasses? And the answer is simple. You can buy them from our eBay store, which is called, you guessed it, Monster Party Store. And ah. hey, uh, we've also got not just shot glasses. We've got t-shirts. We've got the legendary monster party cap. We've got PPE cloth masks. And if you happen to be a Patreon supporter, we will throw in free surprise goodies, courtesy of our friends, 
Ted Haynes and Jason Lindsay from Biff Bang Pow Toys. That's Two right. lovely people battling it out in the arena of our hearts. And I say they're both winners. <laughs> Absolutely. And Ted Haynes, of course, foam fabber extraordinaire, who you've uh, also heard us interview at Monster Palooza just recently. And it was great to see him there as well. Yes. Okay. So this Patreon thing. Now, yes. it's been a few weeks. We did Monster Palooza. It was very, right? very, very hectic. We're all exhausted. There's no way you mm-hmm. can expect me to remember what this Patreon thing is all about. Can you refresh my, refresh my memory, please? All right. Well, much in the way Angelique Pettyjohn and an aluminum foil outfit could bring excitement to a boring day on Triskelion, <laughs> Patreon <laughs> brings excitement by offering bonus Monster Party content to our patrons. Now, we're talking bonus audio episodes, special Monster Party shows like Monster Party Masterpieces, Monster Party Presents, and our various Toy Time episodes where we show how money can actually buy happiness. Uh, We also have behind-the-scenes convention footage like our Monster Palooza video we just posted, and a multi-part video diary of our famous trip to Japan. And for all you readers out there, we've got multiple collections of vintage sci-fi and horror fiction edited by our resident Lyscarian, John Bordeaux. Wow. Well, that sounds like a wealth of material, but um, I got to tell you guys, I'm I'm frankly sort of broke from all the shopping I did at Monster Palooza, well, so yeah. I don't know if I can afford uh, this uh, this bounty. Okay, well... For the price you'd pay me to make you a do-it-yourself Gorn cannon from things I found in my garage, you (laughs) could become a Monster Party patron. And that price is just $5. $5 a month. What? That's that's incredible. You you can't get the Battle Royale Lego action playset for that price. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> that's true. Oh, that thing's been out of print forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, well, consider me in the arena. How do I sign up for this? Well, all you got to do is you go to patreon.com, you go to Monster Party, you click join, you follow the instructions, and next thing you know, you'll be having more fun than a master with a brand new blaster. <laughs> And speaking of master blasters, you can find us on social media. We are really? on face. <laughs> I don't know. You can find us on Facebook <laughs> at Monster Party TV. YouTube is also Monster Party TV. Uh-huh. Uh, we are on the X, formerly their Twitter, at uh-huh. Monster Party HQ, and also Instagram at Monster Party HQ. And hey, wherever you're listening to us. Please take a moment, find a way to send us your thoughts, write us a review. iTunes is a great place for reviews. Uh, Wherever we find it, we will appreciate it and we will read it on the air. And we won't just read your review. James will tattoo it right above his snake Pliskin Cobra. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Stroth. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! And watch movies and TV shows that feature arenas. And we'll see you at the Monster Party Thunderdome. It's not what you think. (laughs) Can I just say one thing? I did... See the quiet place day one, the third oh. one. Yes, <clears throat> how is and it? And in my opinion, it's the best one. Really, oh, really? I, I actually like yes. the second one too. Look, I like the first one, I like the idea of it more than the movie. The mm-hmm. movie had so many plot holes, and so many times, James, did you see it? I did not because I know of it, I know enough about it. I've seen parts yeah. of it, but I've never seen the whole thing. Yeah. Aliens invade, and they're blind, but they're very sensitive to sound, so that's how they find you. And the slightest sound will get them to come after you. And so we had the first one where it's a family trying to survive, and they've got this little house where they're holed up in, and you know they're making sure that everything is quiet. And they're the most unquiet, quiet people (laughs) that you'll ever experience. Right. And then the second one is kind of more of the same, but the first one is how it all starts. And as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, 
This is the type of film that I wanted from the Alien franchise, where oh, right, it's right. the aliens on Earth, and they're crawling across skyscrapers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so you yeah. do get a lot of that kind of action. And I would also say that the leads in the film are more interesting than any of the past ones. So, so this, is the, this is the third one you're talking about. This is the third one, yes. Okay, okay. And, yeah, yeah, uh, we'll I think you would like it. I think, uh, I think okay. all of you would enjoy it. Cool, cool. I, sh- I shall put that on my list. And there you go. Yeah. And then I'm going to say one more thing, and that is that I was also watching today The Dark Crystal, which I hadn't watched in I don't know how long. The original and film. The original film, and I've reassessed it, and I have to say that it is more interesting than I remember it being. It's beautiful looking. Yes. But it is not the most exciting movie. <laughs> well, Matt, Matt, if you but if you reassess the original film, then you should really check out the TV series. They made it to No, I'm serious. Why is that funny, Larry? <laughs> I, mean, I, know, I, I think like I know saying, what that's like saying that's like saying, you know. Okay, I know you have some issues with <laughs> Star Wars. But no, check out the acolyte, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These, well, no, but but I think but I, the first one. But I think the actually, I think the TV, the Dark Crystal TV series is in a, in a way better than the film. They do a respectable job, and it they they create the the world building is better oh, in the TV okay. series I mean, to me. I, I mean, mean, if you're into that, yeah. That, well. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm sort of not. <laughs> the you're, problem is you're not the, into fantasy and little well, puppet people. Things. See, Larry is not <laughs> lying. <laughs> He's not lying. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot to get me to care about the little puppet man and his lady <laughs> running around trying to find the fucking crystal that we have to hear right. about every every three fucking minutes. Right. Well, hey, what are you, you oh, where's uh, weren't you waiting though? I, I mean, look, Kate. Maybe I was a little twisted or whatnot. You know, I I, I liked it. I didn't love. It. I thought it was neat. I thought it was. It is but, neat. But uh, but but I thought there was going to be this moment where the girl with the wings and the guy. I thought they were going to get it on somewhere. You know, we should need some puppet action. You sound like me. That, that, that's we, that's dark crystal Friday? slash. That's Did slash we switch fiction. bodies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. See, well, I, 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 yeah. it's, it's the new me after Monster Palooza. That's, that's <laughs> well, it now, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but Jim Henson was the voice of the main, whatever he is, the little boy man running around. Uh, right? I um, think so. I'm not sure. It was it him or Frank Oz? I can't remember who was who. Um, I didn't they change it, or didn't they change the voice? Oh, yeah, I'm not I sure. They, no. I yeah. thought I they changed the voice because it was too recognizable. Uh, as okay. Jim Henson. <clears throat> right. Oh, okay. Like well, that's sounding that too be. much like Kermit. Yeah. Well, that that's be. that's just it. And and all of those guys, all of those, all the people that yeah. did those puppets, they were all known for doing the voice too. And yeah. there were issues. And let, let's face it. I, I, okay, maybe this is the ba- terrible thing, but am I the only one? When I saw Empire Strikes Back, and I first see Yoda. Yeah. Yep. The first thing that came to mind goes. He sounds like Fozzie Bear. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're totally and, no, and absolutely, and, and, and a little look, like Miss Piggy. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, you see, you it's know, like all of them look, together. I, it's yeah. like I think now we are so far away from the Muppet Show, but people yeah. listening to our show, they don't realize the Muppet Show was a. That was a hit. TV yeah, show. Yes, Frank, was. And Frank Oz has such a distinctive voice. Yes. But it took yeah. it took me a minute. It took me. I I, mean, I totally agree with you, Larry. That when Yoda came on, it took me a second oh, wait, to go. What's your weapon? I feel you. Like, oh shit! Is, is, wow! Is he going? Go, hey, I have a little joke for you. Yeah. <laughs> is there is there is there a guy gonna run in with a bomb? And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, G- Gonzo's gonna come in. And, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, and but I, I warmed to it. I warmed to it. Yeah, yeah. Ex- and then, and then Jedi came along, and everybody was a muppet, and it was just that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Once you had Matt, okay, yeah. okay. I'm sorry, not to beat a dead horse no, here, go but ahead. wouldn't go you? Ahead. Wouldn't you say it's like we have come to a time now where everyone does the Yoda voice. Everyone yeah, does the yeah, Yoda yeah. And, and everyone thinks of it as Yoda. But when that film came out back in 1980, people were alive at that time. You went to see that movie and you watched the Muppet Show. It was hard to distinguish the two. But yeah. now we're so far away from the Muppet yes. Show TV series. Now it's like it's the, it's the Yoda voice. 
Yeah, but yeah. See, so here, but that's <clears throat> when I will give I I will give all the Star Wars people kudos and Frank Oz and everybody involved with manipulating Yoda because I was hesitant and then I got on board. Like yes, and, and so yes. I give them credit for making it work. Because it yeah, did it was... eventually work. I was like, okay, I'm all right with this. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it was fine. But the Dark Crystal, I was really impressed by all the creatures. And even, yeah. you know, how they made everybody, how they would switch to like a kid in a costume or something running. Yeah. And then yeah. it would be a puppet. Like all of yeah. that, all the magic of it, I thought, was great. It's just, as a story, that character, the little elfin kid is yeah. not all that interesting at all. It moves as slow as molasses. And I think it, it moves that way because they took so much time and effort and they were so meticulous about everything and everything looks so beautiful and gorgeous that they wanted everyone to look at it. Yeah. And yeah. so that's why it moves the way it does. Brian Froud, right? He's the designer. Yeah. 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 He's like a designed all the, it's, I mean, a lot of the creatures. And, and it's beautiful stuff. It's gorgeous. But yeah. Matt, Matt, wouldn't you, would you say that Dark Crystal is kind of like, like, I guess there's a criticism about Blade Runner or the second Blade Runner or even the Dune films where there's this environment, this world that's created. And some people say, oh, it moves so slowly. And it's, there's a world that's created. So maybe something like that, if it doesn't hit you, yeah, I guess maybe it does seem like molasses. And, uh, you know, and there, it's true, Matt. When I was watching Dark Crystal, I was going, come on, let me let's know, go. Let me go. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's go. get and to it. Yeah, Storytelling, there has to be a hook. There has to be a drive, you know, something yeah. to Stop. keep you involved. Stop talking about what you're looking for and look for it and, and all, <laughs> go on the all, adventure. It's almost like if you condensed it. You know, you could tell yes, the story yeah. maybe for an hour, maybe yeah. 45, 50 sure. minutes, maybe. Absolutely. But, but look, look, I, you know, I, I still have my five foot cardboard standee. standee? Really? Dark, yeah, it's, a, it's a 3D one. And really? It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful standee. Hmm. And the artwork is gorgeous. And it was very state of the art at the time. And I, I do know this. If it, if it, if it had done phenomenal business, they would have done a bunch of other stuff, sure, but it just right, did right. okay to when, so right. then they, they didn't do another film like that for a while. There's labyrinth, but it was it, a different it kind of thing. Di- yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, human actors and yeah, human yeah, actors. Uh, uh, commenting on Blade Runner. What I would say sets Blade Runner apart is the fact that it's mirroring your standard film noir atmosphere and even pacing at times. Yeah. Because, that's what film noir does. The the city itself is a character. Yeah. And and they do that very well in Blade Runner. And and I think that was lost on people when it first came out. Yeah. Especially yeah, after sure. especially after Star Wars and, and all Raiders. Of that nonsense. Yeah. yeah. But right. I, I will say this. I want to commend you for after all this time for going back to Dark Crystal and go, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it another shot. And I, I, I give you a lot of credit, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. And, and uh, you know, I'm still ready for Human Centipede Night. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. That and, Chitty Ch- that and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. We're going to do it. Yes. <laughs> On the same night? No. Yes, of course. Know. That'd be crazy. Uh, what, what, look, I'll tell you what. We'll do, we'll do Chitty Chitty Bang Bang second. And that way it'll, like, make it'll you'll fix leave, everything for you. Yeah, you'll leave with a good taste in your mouth. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What a good way to words, go out on this. It'll be something that's truly scrumptious. That's, <laughs> that's right. Chitty, chitty, bang, and then bang, and then bang. 